So, as I mentioned, our first speaker is joining us from Lima, Peru, Dr. Henry Tantaleon. Henry, I hope you can see us and hear us. Um, is currently a full professor at the Professional School of Archaeology at the National University of San Marcos, Lima, Peru. He graduated in archaeology at the same university and then obtained his master's and PhD in prehistoric archaeology at the Autonomous University of Barcelona, Spain. He has been a professor at various Peruvian and foreign universities, uh, including the Autonomous University of Barcelona, the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, the University of Rennes in France, uh, the Escuela Superior Politécnica del Litoral in Ecuador, um, the Stanford University in the United States, and he is currently the, a research associate at the French Institute for Andean Studies in Lima, the Coastal Institute of Archaeology at the University of California in Los Angeles, and the University of South Florida. He currently co-directs the Chincha Archaeological Program on the south coast of Peru and directs the Chicama archaeological program on the north coast of Peru. Uh, he is the founder and principal investigator of the Peruvian Institute of Archaeological Studies, and currently he is also the director of the Archaeological Museum of San Marcos University. I have no idea when he finds the time to do all those things, but uh, he's a very talented archaeologist, and, and I think we're all going to enjoy his talk. He's published many scientific articles in different specialized journals and books, he recently published several important books, including uh, Peruvian Archaeology, A Critical History, uh, another book, The Ancient Andean States, Political Landscapes of Pre-Hispanic Peru, and his edited book uh, recently came out, um, Andean Ontologies, New Archaeological Perspectives, from our own University Press of Florida. Dr. Tantaleon brings a wealth of knowledge of how complex Andean states form their societies uh, research that is based on empirical studies of multiple sites in the Andes. Uh, his writing is deeply informed by social theory and cross-cultural analysis. Uh, Henry, it is an honor to have you with us today, even though virtually, and welcome. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes, you look, yes, we see and hear you, great. Hey, great, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, first, uh, I need to give my deep uh, apologize because I'm not with you in this occasion. So, uh, because this uh, uh, sadly pandemic uh, times, uh, we are not uh, able to, to travel to, to Florida. Even I was uh, agenda with another friends in Florida, uh, including uh, Tampa, uh, because uh, my best friend in University of South Florida, Charles Stanis, is my colleague for many years in this university working in Peru. So I was uh, uh, sad because I, was, I, 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 I cannot be with you. So anyway, Thank you to attend to this uh, uh, symposium, this lecture, and also thank you to uh, be very interesting in my country. You know, this ex exposition, uh, this exhibition called Machu Picchu and the Golden Empires of Peru is a nice uh, excuse to join around a subject that is very interesting to everybody and especially to me. Uh, I thank to Boca Raton Museum of Art, especially to Dwayne Smith, and obviously to Michael Horswell to think about me uh, to give this keynote in this symposium, and obviously to Florida Atlantic University uh, professor. Thanks to, them, to, thanks to them to create this space to communicate some of my ideas about the ancient Andean societies. As Dr. Horswell uh, told you, recently I published this book. It's not a propaganda, of course. If you know the one, you can buy it. So uh, in my lecture today, I will uh, speak about many ideas that I Brought in this book that the, the, the best uh, or the most important goal of, of this book 
is to create a synthesis of the first states in the pre-Hispanic Peru. Uh, and in this exposition, Machu Picchu and the Golden Empires of Peru, many of the objects are coming from this kind of societies in the sociopolitical socio level, call it as states or empires. Uh, one note before to start. Uh, when we are talking about states of, or empires, we have this kind of sensation about that we are uh, trafficking with uh, concepts or ideas or categories uh, bring to archaeology in Americas uh, from Western world. The, 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 the category of a state or empire obviously are coming from uh, Europe, Central and Western Europe, exactly. So, but in this point, as archaeologists and for the general public, we need some kind of word or concept to start to understand these societies. So my humble uh, proposal in this lecture is talk about how these societies in the past, in a pre-Hispanic time, they can construct, they can build a splendorous societies without means or ways that we know in our contemporary times, even including pandemias, including uh, diseases, including uh, climatic change. Those are, are, are things that are very uh, known by now, uh, but in the past were very, very uh, difficult to uh, in front by this society. So I will share my PowerPoint presentation for not to be uh, uh, for not to be uh, wor uh, worried. So you can you can you see it? Yes. Can you see my PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Great. Thank you. So we we will start. In my recent book, I have established that the only that only the Moche, Wari, Chimu, and the Inca elites were able to generate consolidate, institutionalize, and even expand over large territories into state forms of political organization. However, it's important to note that many elements present in this, in this state forms appeared in other societies such as Coral, Sechin Alto, and Chavin Tehuanta. Obviously, innovation in leadership in these earlier societies we rework it and amplify it by the later pre-Hispanic state societies. In this conference, I will examine the discontinuities and continuities in the case studies analyzed in my research, especially with, re with regard to the economic, political, religious, and physical coercive military social control strategies of their states. The main purpose is to highlight that each state formation generated a series of unique characteristics as well as share some common features. All of these were a product of historical factors that developed throughout the history of the Andean states. Fear of this uh, question about the Andean states uh, is about the location. As you know, we are located in Peru in this Andean area, and each state society studied, developed in its, in its own 
geographical and climatic setting. They establish their cities in the unique landscapes. Thus, capital cities developed in coastal valleys, as for example, Huacas de Moche, Chan Chan, and in an inter Andean mountain valleys, as for example, the Cusco city that probably uh, uh, all of you know, and even in the intermediate spaces between inter Andean valleys and Puna grassland, thus uh, lands that are up to 4,000 meters above sea level, as for example, the city of Wari, the capital of the Wari Empire. Also, many of these societies were character characterized by concentrated urban population, such as their capital city. Most of the habitats resided in dispersed communities or towns. As we have seen throughout the cast cases studied, each society established its settlement to maximize the productive potential of its communities, but above all, according to the needs of, of the elites that inhabited the capital cities. For example, coastal cities such as Moche and Chimú established the settlement in relation to the coastal valleys. For their part, the Wari and the Incas focused on a combination of agricultural and livestock production. In this way, agricultural resources expanded, but so did the rising of camelids, llamas or alpacas or vicuña. Because of this, the Wari and Inca dominated other areas away from the sierras or highlands, particularly on the coast. Highland states also increased, increased agricultural production in the upper coastal valleys. What uh, we can talk about architecture. In the case studied, we witnessed a great diversity in settlement and, and, and architectural patterns. These differences are due to the differing imperial strategy of the elites, the characteristics of the local environment for building, and even the local architectural tradition of each population. It is noteworthy that the organization of labor changes over time depending upon, upon the particular historical circumstances. Many of the buildings, especially their orientation and architectural form, differed. For example, in some societies, they chose to build so superimposed platform mounds, as the case of Moche that you can see in this figure. And other societies preferred more extensive and orthogonal site plans, as the example of Wari or Chan Chan, as you can see in the left uh, uh, side, or even the Cusco city. According to the available materials and the ability of elites and communities to build their own settlements, we have seen that each society built its own urban centers with a variety of materials. These include clay and stone, materials that, e that are easily found in, me in many of the environments Use it but humans. Coastal societies as Moche and Chimú and the coastal sites of Wari and Inca use it adobe, adobe bricks as the main building material. But even there, you can see a remarkable differentiation in the sizes and morphologies of the adobes. In the case of stone, we see that the Wari tended to, to use mainly fill stones, rocks. However, in some important buildings, such as those in the city of Wari, you can find large, finely carved blocks. In the Inca cases, as you know, possibly in, this, in the Sierras or Highlands, large blocks of finely carved stone were used. So you can also find Inca buildings with semi-queried stones. What we can say about the population, uh, if you see in comparative uh, terms, 
the population of the cities in the in the in the in the prehispanic Peruvia Peru is low is lowest than the the contemporary cities, for example, in Europe, Asia, or Africa. But these have a interesting uh, explanation that I will not abort in this in this lecture. As we can see, the strategies of the elites and and the environmental environmental condition generated the differences that we found in the settlement of each uh, society. And though, as, as we have seen, the population estimate is very controversial because it's a archaeologist uh, discussion no? that uh, needs to have with a methodology that you use for to calculate the population. It's an archaeologist issue. Although, as we, was, as we have seen, the population of each of the main centers of each society studied is different, but anyway, is an uh, important number. That is why establishing a general notion of what a city is in the end becomes complicated if its characteristics and the form of social practices and strategies developed by the elites and their related groups are not considered. In fact, in contemporary archaeology, we have a discussion about if in the Andean uh, societies in the pre-Hispanic time, we have really cities. Because again, city is a category used in Europe. And many times when we try to translate these uh, categories to the Andean world, we have these differences. So anyway, is this figure that you can use to calculate how uh, populated was a city in the ancient world. As can be seen in this table, the life of each of the main cities varied over time. This was due to the different historical factors among which the success of the elites stand out in their ability to construct and implement their urban planning. The cases of Chan Chan and Cusco are different because the historical development of their capital cities included invasions by hostile populations. Aside from this case, there were cities that survived for several centuries, such as Huacas, the Mochi, and Warri. As we, we can talk about the material culture, the artifacts, the main subject of the uh, exposition or exhibition as the golden empires of Peru. Uh, as we have seen, each society developed its own unique material culture that expresses the ideology and art of that society. This tradition differed due to technological, functional, and aesthetic qualities of the craft production of each society. Likewise, the elites demanded and sponsored artistic and elaborate canons, especially those used in administrative and ritual spaces, as well as for the context of their graves. Many of the objects that you can see uh, actually in our museum uh, coming from these kind of tombs, many of them sadly from looters or waqueros. Each elite preferred different kinds of artifacts produced under its auspices. In this way, much elites valued metals and ceramics other other pro products for their part, Wari elites focused on textiles and ceramics quite a lot. Chimu elites valued fabrics and metals. Finally, the Inca elites tex valued textiles and metals in a very important way. Another interesting uh, question about the 
social practices in the past in, in South America and especially in the Andes is about the treatment of human bodies. In life, different state societies market their social identities through their own bodies. With that objective, they made modifications of their skulls, moche warian incas, and even the Paracas uh, society. Market, market their body with tattoos, moche, as in, uh, as in the example, for, exa for example, in the ladies of chaos in the Chicama Valley, a moche queen, or made particular hairstyles. For example, moche, wari, chimu, and incas have these practices. The elites of these societies were the first to, to differentiate themselves from the rest of the population through this mechanism. The social groups below the elites often imitated if they were allowed such body modifications. In that, each society demonstrated unique characteristics in its, in its burial practices even when there were differences within each society due to social hierarchies. The funeral patterns are different from each other, including the location of the graves, the burial contents, disposition of, of post-mortem post bodies and rituals. For example, the Moche and Chimu adopted a burial pattern in which the bodies were placed in an extended manner. Likewise, the burial architecture was different. Funeral garments were also different and correlated with the handicraft production of each society. What, uh, what happened with the change in the, main, in the means of persuasion and coercion? The, two most important strategies to control the population by this uh, kind of state in the ancient Peru. Due to, due to different historical and social context, elites choose various means of persuasion and coercion. They modulated the intensify of this control over the inhabitants in their respective areas of influence. Coercion, can be seen indirectly through the use of religious media, as you can see in this uh, fine line drawing uh, coming from a moche vessel, ceramic vessel. Direct means of coercion is evidenced by the use of the militia or army. Although the moche elites utilized religion, there was in this an increase in the level of physical violence involving real battles and human sacrifices. In Wari, we see true physical coercion. The army was also the primary means of conquest over large areas of the Central Andes, conquering many communities. However, Wari elites also retained persuasive means of coercion, such as religion. The Chimu seemed to downplay religion, although they certainly created some ritual practices. Chimu military strategies helped extend their territories and subdue for powerful elites and other communities. Finally, the Incas deployed a number of coercive measures over the subject population and organized a number of armies in the Andes, like their predecessors they retained persuasive strategies based on tradition, feasting, lineage, and religion. This is an issue very interesting in the ancient Andean world because there are two strategies, two main strategies to control the population, the religion and the physical violence. Another thing interesting in the uh, Andean state society is about the different religious pantheons that they uh, use it uh, to uh, practice. A great diversity of gods 
were created and revered by the elites and peoples of the ancient Andean states. In, gener in general, the most important religious deities that emerged in pre-Hispanic Andes were linked to the sun and the moon. In reality, each elite, elite developed, acquired, or transformed a series, a series of gods according to their own local realities or traditions. Even many of their own ancestors were considered divine, and of course, they served as their founding of or mythical heroes. It is only with the emergence of such belief systems that amalgamated animistic visions with the development of religion with supernatural beings that we see ideological strategies for the control of such a population. The Moche had as a main divinity, an entity known as the degollador or, or, or cutter head, as you can see in the left side, uh, uh, modeled in the temple of the moon in the Huacas of Moche complex. This was an anthropomorphic divinity with zoomorphic features that was characterized by carrying a knife in one hand and a severed head in the other. Under this divinity, there were a series of other also related to animal features. Also, the hills and the sea were very important for their religions. For their part, the Wari elites accepted as one of their main deities a character with a staff in each hand, a character or personage that was taken from Tiwanaku tradition, a culture uh, today located in the Bolivia area. This character was accompanied by other anthropomorphic beings with zoomorphic elements. For the Chimu, other characters related to the moon and the sea were central to their religion. Finally, for the Incas, the sun was the main divinity. They also revered the moon, the stars, and the lightning. Likewise, we know from ethnohistorical references that Huiracocha, the creator of the world, was an important divinity for the Incas. As is now in in the historical references, the early Spanish chronicles, the Incas also revered different landscape features such as mountains, lakes, and the sea. Another interesting question or issue is about the use of ecological spaces. Moche and Chimú were concentrated in the same valley, in the Moche Valley, in the northern Peruvian coast close to the Trujillo city. Other societies drew from differ different ecological regions to develop their elite class. The fact that Andean states developed on the coast, highlands, altiplano, and eastern slopes, even in the jungle, indicates that there are no geographical factors in state formation here. Enviro en environmental determinism does not work in this case. Rather, each elite class and society developed in their unique areas and created economic, political, religious, and coercive military strategies that were incorporated in their respective state society. Thus, for example, coastal societies developed important agricultural systems in the valleys, along with agricultural production, the coastal societies exploited marine resources. Highland societies invested in canals and reservoirs, agricultural terraces and sunken fields. They also intensified camelite pastoralism and access to the eastern slopes to, for a number of products useful in their political economy. Now, we will talk about the continuities or similarities in the ancient Andean states. One of these for sure is the use of the monumental architecture to express uh, their political power and obviously religious power. 
in all of the cases studied, uh, Moche, Wari, Chimu, and Inca, we have found that the elites and the related communities developed some kind of monumental architecture. It is evident that monumental architecture symbolizes the ability of elite, elites to direct and organize collective labor. Monumental architecture was also a fundamental part of its political and religious social control strategy. Another issue about the similarities in the use of the space or, or territory, territory, you can see in the Ancient Andean states. As we have seen in the cases studied, states sought to control resources zones from different ecological regions found in Andean geography. States preferred to absorb regions with a pre-existing political infrastructure. This was the case uh, most known of the Incas. This led to a pattern called archipelago territories or islands uh, territory in which empires such as the Wari or the Inca held discontinuous territories. For example, you can see uh, these landscapes where Cerro Baul mountain and the Cerro Baul site in the top of this mountain with this particular, particular form is a classic example of archipelago territory where the Wari put a, col a colony in the middle of territory dominated by Tiwanaku society uh, that have his capital in, in the Lake Titicaca area. States prefer to absorb this kind of regions. Spanish, a colleague uh, of mine, argues that Tiwanaku selectively controlled distant territories and roads while leaving vast areas outside of state control. This may characterize Wari and other states as well, emphasizing a focus on roads and outposts. Even on the coast with Mocha and Chimu, we see that the territories were discontinuous. They reached the, third, the strip adjacent to the coast concentrated human population near the rivers and encouraged the control of distant discontinuous, discontinuous lands. Another similarity in the use of the space of the Andean states are this, the use of sacred landscapes and the, the, the practice of animistic religions. We find in all of the case studied and many others in the pre-Hispanic Andes that the construction of monuments now as huacas, you know, this uh, Quichua and Aymara word, that means a sacred object or place that is shared with a uh, power or energy. The word in Quichua for this energy is uh, Kamaj. is central in the development of social and political complexity. In this way, the main buildings of Moche, Wari, Chanchan, and Cusco became huacas. Some natural formation, mainly hills, as you can see in this case of the Cerro Blanco in the Moche Valley, were also huacas representing the physical manifestation of these ideologies. Many of these natural features were incorporated into the orbit of the political religious center, such as Cerro Blanco in Huacas de Mocha. This use of natural and cultural landmarks seems to be a part of a long Andean tradition that preceded the rise of the, rise of the state elites. For example, Caral, is a kind of huaca. Sechin Alto is a kind of huaca. Even Chavin de Huantar, probably one of the most famous oracles in the pre-Hispanic time, was a huaca. These huacas were connected to political and religious strategy, but also they indicated a conception of the cultural landscape shared by different social groups. The success of these strategies 
employed by state elites was based in part of, on their ability to incorporate this ritualized landscape. Another important feature uh, and similarity in the ancient Andean state is about the practice of performances. In all cases of the Andean state studied, massive rituals were performed outdoors and in the principal building, sponsored and directed by the elites. The open spaces near the buildings or wakas, and of course the plazas in such each main settlement, were the spaces in which collective ceremonies were practiced. Although we usually do not have the direct evidence of these ritual practices, we can surmise the context through the analysis of architecture, art, and the material remains found at this site. For example, you can see uh, in this ceramic vessel and this wooden uh, model, architectural model, the practices of per this kind of performances. In the, kind of the, in, 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 in the case of the moche, in the left hand, you can see a king in the top of a pyramid. And in the uh, right hand, you can see a model of a citadel or palace of the Chimu king, where he is adored or revered by his uh, servants. In some extraordinary cases, we have representation of these rituals depicted on murals, ceramic vessels, and the like. We see that these performances and the social spaces, spaces in which they were carried out were important components of the reproduction of religions and political strategies of the state. Another important, important uh, similarity or continuity in the uh, long durée process uh, in pre-Hispanic time is about the practice of pilgrimage. That is a global feature in different uh, ancient societies across the globe. Pilgrimage was a widespread social practice in the pre-Hispanic Andes and became more pronounced with the formation of the ancient Andean state. Pilgrimages involved the mobilization of large ma masses of individuals who were directed toward fixed points in space, mainly the capital city. Most of these elite directed activities appropriated natural or pre-existing wakas and attracted a significant number of people or pilgrimage to these prominent features of, of the landscape. These social practices, pilgrimage, is one of the oldest and most persisted in the Andes. It assumes that different communities from different regions meet in central places. These places were built by the elites and the ritual practices of the commoners themselves. Although in some cases, it seems that economic or military issues explain the movement of people to capital cities. Most likely, all this pilgrimage had an important religious motivation as many religious practices around the world. This movement of human groups across the landscape created a diversity of settlements and allowed the, the integration of various peoples and regions in the Andes. What happened with the cult of the ancestor, or Malkis or mummies? In pre-Hispanic societies, considerable time, materials, and effort were invested in the conservation and veneration of ancestors. These widespread practices was enhanced when the elites of the ancient Andean states were the main object of such veneration. In most of the cases studied, the bodies of the principal elites were subject to important care and rituals. In fact, their bodies were preserved and even buried or exposed in the main samples, settlement, sorry. As you can see in the left, in the left hand, you can see the reconstruction of Warikin found recently in El Castillo of Guarmey, a valley in the northern north coast of Peru, 
And in the right hand, you can see an uh, illustration of the Guaman Pomas de Ayala uh, manuscript that you can see the veneration, the adoration of the Malkis or Mamis of the Incas, especially. Another impor important thing and similarity uh, of all of these states in the ancient Andes is the uh, sacrifices and offering. A widespread, a widespread practice in the ancient Andes was to make offerings to the Huacas or special places of each community or even to those in other communities. The Andean landscape was dotted with such landmarks especially associated with complex societies. These practices helped solidify the community social relationship between individuals and group within the society. In many of the state societies, human sacrifice was incorporated as an official practice. The, the, there is a substantial evidence in the main temples or buildings. This was the case of Huacas de Moche, Wari, Chanchan, and Cusco. The sacrifices were represented in their artifacts, especially ceramics, as in the case of Moche, as you can see in the ceramic vessel in the left hand, Wari and Chimu, and in the murals of the most important buildings, such as Huaca de la Luna. As you can see in the right hand, uh, you can see a mummy uh, found in a high mountain in the Andes, or call it a Capacocha. That is, was the sacrifice of a little woman or child in these glaciers. Another interesting uh, issue in the continuity of this uh, tradition of ancient Andean state is the power relationship based on real and or symbolic kinship. Kinship is a relationship based on consanguinality and is the natural way in which the human beings of a community integrate for social and world life. In the Andes, kinship formed the basic structure of communities and involved a series of commitments in which reciprocity was the fundamental principle for the maintenance and survival of society. Kinship was incorporated into the political structure of elites, even when they rose to power. They generated royal families that became distant from the rest of the community, and this established their privileged place in the social pyramid. From historical sources, we know that the lineages of rulers passed on their political and religious positions to their descendants. It was a, a inheriting of the power. There was a, thus a monopoly of power based on kinship. Likewise, DNA evidence shows that in older societies such as the Moche, it was a specific families that inherited power directly. This is the case, for example, of uh, the lineage of Lords of Sipan. Other power relations could be established at a symbolic level by linking with these royal families. Another important similarity or continuity is the sharing of political and religious power. In the pre-Hispanic Andes, social practices did not clearly differentiate between politics and religion. It seemed that politics and religion were intimately connected from the beginning of the development of complex society and remained a feature of later state societies. The maintenance, the maintenance of both spheres of power by the rulers was important and necessary for their exercise and legit legitimacy with respect to the dominated communities. Political norms had to be established in the early states, as was done later in the case of the Incas, which established and legitimized the power of the rulers. As we saw, their own bodies were revered as Malkis or Mamis or Inca Mamis and elevated to a religious level, 
in this, in this case, the mummy of the Inca was converted in a huaca as well. In fact, the available iconography and funerary context express the idea that the main rulers were both kings and priests. What about the control of craft production? Artisan, art, 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 artisanal production controlled by the elites was the basis on which they could direct the economy, accumulate wealth, raise to it got goods to the subordinate groups, and control the forms of communication and religious life. One way or another, elites controlled the production of artisans, especially when they lived in their main, in, in main cities. Thus, except for some specific cases, the greatest amount of, of, of artifact production used by the elites was carried out in the political centers, their cities. The data indicate that most of the artisans produced the artifacts that were de delivered to the elites in spaces very close to their palaces and temples. It's a thing called attached specialist in the archeological uh, jargon. And finally, one of the most interesting and uh, marvelous uh, similarity in this kind of societies is that total absence of pricing Fix, of price mix, fixing markets and money. Uh, an important feature of the Andean state is that they did not develop price fixing markets. This is what can be inferred from the ethno-historical analysis for the Inca era. Archaeologically, little to no evidence of this type of market has been found. Archaeologically, Archaeologically, this means that unlike other ancient states in the world, the elites of the pre-Hispanic state did not develop a mechanism to control economic exchanges through the pricing of goods and services and exchange in markets. Markets were for barter, trueque. In this way, the elites developed a series of alternative strategies to boost the economy of their society. I think that was uh, studied by Carl, by Carl Porlaghi, for example, an important economic uh, historian. Also, as Murra, Joe Murra, uh, a, a great anthropologist and archaeologist, points out reciprocity and redistribution were the main economic me mechanism of Andean society. The ruling, the ruling elites relied of this widespread pre-existing economic mechanism and oriented them to their particular benefits. In some cases, the elites of the Andean states developed administrative trade, Sensu Polangi, in which the exchange of certain goods was controlled. The elites valued and controlled cert certain products with, within their own exclusive economy. For example, the Incas valued textile products more than, me, that more than metals. Okay, we are finishing. And I will give uh, a pair of uh, sentences for finishing my, my lecture. In this talk, we reviewed the main differences that existed between the ancient Andean states, geography, environment, particular historical trajectories, interaction with other societies of diverse economic and political organization, and very specific events constituted and gave the particular expression to this society. We have also been able to appreciate what we're the similarities in the rise of these societies. Despite the unique characteristic of each case, of each state, we see that there, there were important economic, political, and religious features common to all. Combined, the similarities and differences 
allow us to disentangle the complex history of each of these remarkable societies. Thank you very much. I expect that my broke English was uh, uh, easy to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tantalian. That was a fascinating lecture that really helped us tie together many of the themes that we were observing at the uh, museum this morning. So we're gonna open this up to uh, questions um, from the audience. So again, if you would like to ask a question, if you would just walk over to this microphone, so you'll be on the camera and Dr. Tantaleon can see and hear you. Anybody have a question? Um, it's a real treat to have uh, probably one of the premier archeologists working in Peru today here with us, uh, Dr. Tantaleon, thank you for that wonderful talk. All right, we have your first question. Good afternoon, Dr. Tantaleon. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is regarding the human sacrificial portion of it. Um, with the exhibit, we saw the tools used, the uh, artwork on pottery, and you suggested in your presentation that it was used as a tool to control populations and such. Now the question is, there's allegations that the human sacrifice um, is overdramatized and that it wasn't as prevalent. What's your input on that? Okay, the, the second question, please. I, 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 I didn't ask that. Okay. So the question was, were human sacrifices as, um, okay, so the allegations are that these, um, were over dramatized by um, the Spaniards to uh, paint the ancient civilizations in a bad light, like as um, um, barbarians to justify the conquest. Is, do you have any thoughts on that? Okay, thank you. I, I understand. Okay, the, the, the first thing is about uh, if the sacrifice is uh, a common practices, but to me, as uh, I, I can see in the, in the, in the cases studied uh, by me and many times research in the field by me, is that the sacrifice is an important tool or way or a strategy, as I, can, I, I, see, I, I say in my, in my book, uh, use it by the least to control the society. If you can see before of the states, we have some examples of sacrifices, but with the moche and even in, in the Wari and Chimu, for example, my colleague uh, Gabriel Prieto uh, recently has uh, found a massive sacrifice in Huanchaco area uh, pertaining to Chimu culture, where the elites were using the massive uh, sacrifices of human uh, sacrifices to uh, control the society. Obviously, this is related with religion. That is a thing very difficult to separate it in the ancient Andean state, as in many societies across the world. Uh, I'm thinking about the Babylonia culture, for example, or Ur graves where you can find many human sacrifices or the uh, 19th century or even 20th century India where you can see that many women were in, in, uh, interned with the uh, principal male in, in, in its uh, own grave. So uh, uh, returning to the pre-Hispanic times, I think that the, sacrifice, the human sacrifice were, were, was one of the most important tool to control or uh, uh, persuade to the people. Okay, I know I, I I don't know if uh, I under, I, I answer your question. It's, it's okay. Yeah. The first. Thank okay. Uh, and and the second question is about my thoughts about the uh, how the Spaniards saw to uh, Incas, especially because it was the culture that uh, they found. Uh, obviously, uh, if we if if we can if we can see the Incas 
uh, in comparative uh, ways uh, with the Western Europe, uh, leaving aside the, uh, the, the Catholic propaganda, uh, I see that there are not much difference in levels of bar barbarism, you know? Uh, the, 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 the thing is that when you uh, read the uh, earliest, earliest Spanish chronicles, you see that people as in, in the Peruvian case, Pedro Cisa de Leon, Bernabe Cobo, all of these uh, Spanish chroni uh, 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 chronists or writers, they are trying to uh, get a image, a figure of the Inca society, where they are putting in bad uh, uh, shape to the Inca elite, because they are trying to justify his invasion. Uh, in fact, in archeological uh, uh, terms, the Incas probably were the, the society that uh, used in a minor uh, quantity the human sacrifices. Probably the most important figure or number of uh, human uh, lost were in the wars because the Inca Empire were most uh, secular than religious state. For the reason, I think that the, the vision, the view of the uh, Spanish was a propaganda view. In, in, the, in, this, in, in this way, they trying to conquer, not just uh, in physical terms, even in ideological terms. So it, 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 this is my thoughts about, about, about this. This the books that we thing. read, aren't they mostly written by the Spanish who won the wars? You know how they say that the victors write the history books. So mm -hmm. when you say that what we have written from the past are the accounts on them, wouldn't you say that's a little biased then? Sorry, I, I, I didn't understand. Is there any bias in the history? Yes, records? yes, the, 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 there is a great bias. There is a great bias for the reason. To me, the you know, historical accounts need to be read uh, very, very uh, critics. You, know? you must be a critical read about the you know, historical accounts, not like the truth. You, you can use by to create hypotheses, but it's not a real history. Thank you, Dr. Tantaleo. No, thank you to you. Okay, it looks like we have our next question. Thank you for an amazing lecture. I just saw the exhibit yesterday and it, it really blew me away. Thank I have, you. I have two questions, please. The first one, you talked about the hierarchy within each uh, culture, Inca, the different cultures, whether they were on the coast or whether they were in places like Machu Picchu. I understand that, but was there a hierarchy among the different societies? Did they look up to the Machu Picchu elite? Um, did they develop on their own? Because some of their work, their artisanship was very, very different from the Machu Picchu. So were they developing as they went along independent of say Machu Picchu or was there some sort of general synergy there? Thank you. Uh, you you say two questions, <laughs> you just one. <laughs> well, I was going to save the other one. The other one is really okay. Okay, okay. No, I, 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 can, I, can, I can answer you. Yeah, this is an interesting question. But my my friend Richard Burger and Lucy Salazar Burger probably they have the the exact uh, answer. But as I I can see, uh, Machu Picchu was the roy, royal place of one Inca. Okay. Uh, in the Inca hierarchy, there were many families or panacas, royal families, that were for the 
uh, 15th century or 16th century when the Spaniards are arrived to Peru, to Andes, they were fighting each other. So uh, in the time of the, uh, of the Incas, they were different royal families that were uh, negotiating the power. In fact, some scholars uh, think that probably there were a dual uh, power where two uh, persons or two families are dominating the power, the political power. So, uh, uh, but in, in fact, uh, as we know, we have a uh, Sapa Inca that was the, the, the king. So it's, it's most like a pyramid in, in, in hierarchical, hierarchical uh, ways. So this is the, the thing. We have a kind of, of, of king and we have the another past uh, kings and their families. The, the interesting thing is that they had, each of these Panaca, Real or Royal family have its own uh, Malki or the deceased king. And they were revered, revered adored this Malki or uh, Mami king. Even they were fighting each other. This is very, very fascinating. No? You, you have a real, a real king or Sapa Inca, but they were cohabitated with another Malkis or another past king in the Inca times. Thank you. The second question is, and this is really a loaded question, um, what happened- I can hear you, sorry. What happened to the people of Machu Picchu? I mean, I've been reading and I read one theory that after their last king or emperor was killed, that they abandoned Machu Picchu for that reason. And I see, I see some similarities here to abandoning a site to the Anasazi, if you know them, they're Native Americans in, in North, uh, in New Mexico that also abandoned their cliff dwellings and other very developed society. So I guess the question is, where did the people that lived in Machu Picchu go? Well, thank you. Uh, the, the thing is that we, know, we don't know exactly when the Machu Picchu was abandoned. We know, we know that it was very, very pre-Hispanic, pre-colonial uh, use of this place. Even they have time to bury people in Machu Picchu. That was the, 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 the bodies that Hiram being and found when he excavated there. So I think that it was, uh, the, the, this site had a lowest a, 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 a abandonment, very, very slow. It, no, it was not as an Asasi site was, were very, very critical, very fast. In the case of Machu Picchu, you can see that they had time for, for to interred his own uh, death before to uh, the final the final abandonment or crisis of the Inca empire. But for example, we doesn't have any uh, example of colonial artifacts in Machu Picchu. So in this case, we know that they never had contact with the Spanish uh, people. That's as we know. Thank you very much. No, thank you for your question. Oh, me and I'm sure everyone else a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, Henry, I think we have time for two more questions because um, we're running a little behind. We could talk all day, but um, so here we go. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for an incredible presentation. I really enjoyed it. What, one question to you. Can you hear? Can you understand me? Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering, you mentioned climate change in the introduction of your talk and how climate change is such a huge problem our world is facing now. What yes. can archaeology do to solve modern problems? What can archaeology contribute? 
well, what, 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 uh, what question? Well, it, it's a thing that I, I uh, think about many times because as archeologists, as I am, uh, I sometimes, uh, probably uh, Michael has the, the, the same feeling. We probably, we are not uh, uh, supporting many contemporary causes. So in, in, in my view, I think the archeologists that in front this evidence of great climatic changes as for example, El Nino no? or Enzo phenomena that were very, very clear in, in, in the sixth century of our era in much times that probably was the cause of the change of the political structure. We saw that the, the societies uh, clearly they can surface these uh, problems. They, uh, they uh, still were producing his society, his artifacts, his agriculture. One interesting thing that we can uh, uh, understand from this society is the kind of different uh, social organization and labor organization to uh, overcome these climatic difficulties. And obviously the technologies that they use. For example, one important thing that the archaeologists can do is reconstruct uh, the ancient technologies, or for example, one thing most important than the channels or the irrigation channels. For example, re recover, re recover it, for example, the, the native uh, uh, species, botanical species, for example, many of the kinds of potatoes are disappearing in our times. And many of the, the, bar, the bar, bar, variety of the diet in the ancient Andean states probably was more great than in the common population in the same area. For example, in the Chicama Valley, the common people is more uh, related with a urban diet. For example, chicken, uh, potato, rice. It's botanical species that are not native. I'm not chauvinist, but I'm, 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 I'm saying that one important thing that the archaeologists can do is recover it, the botanical and zoological species that are disappearing in our times because also the climate change as well. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. And here we go with one more. Hola, um, I am a Peruvian artist based in Miami and I'm very Great. To, to be here today and to uh, learn about your work. I have been doing some research on pre-Columbian iconography and the Andean cosmovision. And currently I am looking into a time in history where the French explorers um, went to Peru and for the sake of their own research started appropriating artifacts and taking them um, in massive numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, this, I wanted to hear your um, thoughts on how this may have impacted, you know, their, the, the local, their own, the own Peruvian um, uh, heritage, the relationship exactly of how Peruvians themselves see their own past or legacy through these Eurocentric lens that earlier you mentioned and how it has, um, and, and this is a personal remark, I guess, how it has detached ourselves from that ancestral cosmovision that is so, so clear and, and beautiful portrayed in the iconography. Okay, thank you. This is a difficult question because uh, it, 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 it have to uh, see with, uh, the political uh, context in, 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 in specifically 
with our cultural heritage. Uh, you mentioned that the French explorers, but we, we can include American explorers, we can include German uh, explorers, even uh, Danish explorers. Uh, probably many of the empires or big states in Europe that were interested in to create a museum. That was a, 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 a Western uh, phenomena. And, and, and I understand this phenomena in its own context. In this, at this time, I'm, I'm not justifying, but I'm trying to uh, understand. At this time, this was the common thing. It was, for example, many societies were very curious about how the Indians in the America uh, lived. And it was almost in the 20th century with the world fairs, for example, where you can, uh, where you can see human uh, examples exhibi exhibited in world fairs at Chicago in, in 1893. I, 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 I guess. So what is the problem with this, with, this, with this phenomena? The problem is that many of the cultural or archeological artifacts are uh, disconnected, are away from, the, from their uh, real uh, uh, descendants. Okay, from the ind indigenous people. So fortunately, there are a movement about the rep repatriation, no? And uh, American, uh, American law passes this NACPRA law that is related with the indigenous objects and grapes. And it's, 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 it's a good example how the archeologists also are very respectful about the indigenous communities. And in many cases, there are a confrontation between the local communities and the museums. But also I saw many good examples where many museums are very open to repatriate these artifacts to their ancestral uh, askers. Because this is a, a thing very important to know, uh, because not many indigenous communities are uh, aware about his own indigenous uh, uh, indigenous uh, ancestrality. So we need to know, and we and we need to study each case uh, in, in in its own right to give a solution to this. Dialogue, I, 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 I will say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, as I said, uh, Dr. Tataleon, I think we could stay here for many hours uh, discussing uh, your research yes. and your perspectives. Um, thank you again for joining us today here in thank Boca Raton from Lima. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I expect that the next time I will you, I will be with you personally. Thank you very much for uh, your invitation. We would invitation. love to have you here at FAU and, and at the Boca Museum. So you're invited anytime you can Thank come. You. Thank you so much for that introduction, Duane. Um, it's a pleasure for us to be here uh, this afternoon with all of you. We are Kuyaiki, as he mentioned. We are a family uh, band group. Uh, we have um, taken the work of our ancestors our great-grandparents, our grandparents, my mother and father who are here with us today and who will perform with us. Um, so we really understand what uh, the place of Andean dance and music is in the daily life of Andean peoples. So we wanted to connect a little bit with the theme of the overall conference and um, we use dance and music, uh, as you saw in the exhibit, as a ritual. Um, it connects us to the broader um, cosmos and also to the underworld, right? So to the Hanan Pacha, the Kai Pacha, and the Uku Pacha. 
um, we do, we connect with it uh, at all times. We are in a dialogue with uh, the cosmos, the stars, the moon, the sun. At the same time, we are in a dialogue with the landscape that we see, with the Apus, which are the sacred mountains that we have, that we believe in, in many points are our own, um, are, are the roots of each of our ayus, of each of our kinship groups. So I'm gonna leave uh, one second for Ruby, who's gonna be doing uh, a small ceremony before we start as my parents interpret a piece from the Ollantay.
cosmos is still alive very much today. What you just heard is a piece that was first um, compilated, researched by my father, Jose Hurtado Samudi over there, uh, in the 1960s when he came back uh, after studying music at a convent, at a monastery. So when he was able to get uh, the lyrics from the elders of the community, um, at that point, uh, Quechua had been eradicated in the central Andes of Peru. There was a census, the first national census that we had in Peru related to what language we spoke um, actually uh, showed the people in Lima, in the, in the places of power, uh, how um, prevalent uh, indigenous language, languages such as Quechua still were in Peru. So when they found out that, especially in our area, uh, we had a very high percentage of bilingual Spanish and Quechua speakers, 85% uh, in 1942, they decided that that couldn't go, so they eradicated uh, the language. So when he was um, transcribing the lyrics, uh, we didn't know Quechua at that point already. They were the first generation to lose the language. Uh, but what I have been able to do through my studies um, of Quechua and of dance and music is look back at the lyrics and what I found is that um, it, 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 uh, it expresses what we have always known, uh, which is that we are very diverse ethnic uh, groups of people in, in Peru before colonization and that, that prevailed uh, during colonization and after. So the song itself is written in a number of um, what today we could go back to um, Quechua varieties of the, the, this Andean language. Uh, but more importantly than that is that there is a, that first part that you saw, the Harawi, which is a, a prayer to the cosmos. And then with very specific words, coded words. So we have code within the song that speaks to this capacity of people to regenerate and transform their uh, environments and their realities. So this song t tells of the story of a group of people who were moved from the coast uh, to the central Andes and how this um, forced migration uh, took a toll on, on, on their, their lives, right? Um, so the, the prayers speak to the deities in the coast as well as in the central Andes. And then the dance steps that we incorporate it speak to also um, codes for regeneration uh, with words such as muyui and tiklai, well, which are uh, code, codes for cycle or reversal. Um, so moving on from that, we wanted to do another song um, that is, uh, we, we want to always uh, showcase how we have, uh, how Andean music is very complex and that it has been unfairly, as much of our culture has been uh, homogenized into one, how people view it as only one thing or as, uh, uh, you know, as, as not having a lot of variety. 
Uh, so what we're going to show you is a piece that probably the very famous uh, Peruvian composer and ethnomusicologist in the early 19th century, Daniela Lomia Robles, he, he went to the Mantaro Valley, where we're from, which is 11,200 feet above sea level, and he heard this uh, and saw this dance of La Jija as he went through the Mantaro and Yanamarca Valleys. And so what I want you to try and do with your ears is try to identify the different movements. If you listen to classical music, uh, you're probably trained for that. So um, try to open up uh, to those, those complexities, the changes in tempo, the slight changes in genres that you're going to see. It is a work song dance very early in the morning um, as people head out to work. And um, our great-grandfather told us that it was a, a song dedicated to the star of Venus. So this is La Jija de Jauja, a threshing work song.
dos caminos, caminos extraños, hay dos caminos, caminos extraños, uno a la vida, otro a la muerte, uno a la vida, otro a la muerte. Hay dos caminos, caminos de acuerdo, hay lo que has dicho, no quiero, no puedo. from the, the Amazonian region and they have come for, for uh, you know, hundreds of years. Uh, when you look at the cultures of the coast in Nazca, uh, in, in, in Moche, you'll find that they had, uh, as well as in Caral, that we have two basic elements that repeat, uh, that we've seen all the way to uh, the time of colonization, which were you know, the musical instruments. You'll see different styles of woodwinds like the quena that Mary Lou's place, and the, the pan flutes, the sikus that she had. They come in different, um, in different materials. Sometimes they're made out of clay, sometimes they're made out of cane, sometimes they were even made out of human bones uh, with a special ritual significance, like you saw in the exhibit again, that connect us not only with the cosmos and um, you know, each other and animals, but also to our dead. Our dead were very present in our lives and um, I think we, we, we still continue that, that tradition of uh, considering our elders very sacred. 
and we always sort of hold a conversation uh, with them as well. So we wanted to take you now to the, the coastal region uh, so that you can see a little bit of the variety. You'll see that we have an influence uh, also from the African slaves that were brought to Peru um, in the types of uh, rhythms that we employ as well as um, in, the, in the lyrics. Um, you'll see the metrics of the coming from Spain of the decimas, et cetera. Uh, but that those are merged uh, with a dance and music style from the Tayang culture, um, you know, that coexisted with the moche. And, and you'll see that there's a fertility dance uh, that was danced uh, in that uh, Piura region, which is the northern coast of Peru, almost um, bordering Ecuador. And so we see the remnants of, of that dance in today's tondero or lundero dance. Um, also, you'll notice, and we always get this question, uh, the kinds of instruments that we play, right? So I would say the pre-colonial instruments that we have are the quena that Mary Luz has been playing and my huancara drum. They come in different sizes, just as, as the flute, the quena flute comes in different sizes and is used for different purposes. Um, and then we have uh, the instruments that come after um, colonization, such as the uh, guitar and the mandolin. And then because we weren't allowed initially to play European instruments, uh, we, we may do. So we made the charango, the Yina's playing right over here, the small guitar. And you see that same story played in, in other places that experience colonization with like uh, Hawaii and the ukulele. And then we have the tres and the cuatro in, in Venezuela and Cuba, um, the tiple in Colombia, et cetera. Instruments that we created because we weren't allowed to play. Um, the cajón also, which is a drum that Mary Luz is sitting on, is, um, it, it was created in Peru because the, when they brought mostly the African slaves from Angola, they knew the, of the ritual significance of drums. So they uh, forbid all drums. So the slaves made do with uh, fruit crates. And so the first cajon was gifted, um, and I was corrected, it wasn't gifted, it was bought by Paco de Lucia in the 70s uh, from the great uh, Afro-Peruvian cajon player, Caetro Soto. So the tondero you're, that you're gonna see is gonna follow all of these different influences that I hope I haven't bored you <laughs> by, by, by letting you know a little bit. And I'm gonna leave Yina because this is the song that we created uh, so that she can tell you a little bit about the lyrics. Hi everybody, my name is Yina. As you, I don't know if all of you know, but we are a family, a big family. It's five siblings, my parents and my husband. He's here from Spain. We have the colonizer figure here. Uh, since, <laughs> thank you. Since we were very, very young, we were taught older songs because my parents were always worried about preserving what we had. Uh, they were the first generation, as Candy said, to lose our language, but they, they were very uh, adamant. They worked as teachers in, in the central areas of Peru and uh, with, the, with the little knowledge and with the little um, possibilities that they had, they, they looked for, for the sounds of our past and they shared them with us. And when we migrated to the U.S., uh, we were lucky enough to, to, to stay together and, and music actually um, kept us together and made us grow as a family. Uh, we're playing a tondero. It's a composition about a woman who uh, was a, uh, suffered uh, abuse. And I met her when I, I was a child. Uh, she came all the way from the north perhaps walking, escaping, you know, you know this, this abusive relationship with three little children. And uh, this is a song for her and for all the people, all the women who suffered this. Thank you.
for the invitation to the, the museum, to FAU. Um, we're alumni, Jose and I, from here. So we really appreciate uh, coming back. Um, if you have any questions, we can take them now. Um, we're, we're happy to, to, to do so. So I don't know if you have any questions. Don't be shy. Oh, tienen preguntas también. Yes. Yeah, so you can follow us on uh, Facebook or Instagram. Um, we, we, it's the first, the second time due to the museum that we've uh, left our quarantine. <laughs> we are very, uh, my, my parents are our elders, so we, we work hard to protect them, so we haven't been playing very often. Uh, but we usually play in, in museums and um, universities and in open spaces lately. <laughs> we're we're going to play uh, uh, in, at the Broward uh, Performing Arts Center, I don't know if the 30 or the, the 30 or the 31st of January. Yes. So. Any other questions that you have for now? Yes, on the back. Yes, you. Oh, yes, thank you. So the videos are uh, made by um, a, a couple of different cinematographers. Uh, one of them is our, our cousin of ours, Henry Juanilla. It was made uh, for, um, for a festivity uh, that we have, uh, that we celebrate now, the 20 de Enero. And it was the salute of the, the official salute from the municipality uh, for all of those that couldn't make it. Uh, it has one of the most important, important characters of the dance, the Huatrila. Who, rep who represents uh, our Sousa, because we are not only Quechua, but also Sousa, our Sousa ancestors in the Mantaro Valley, who were also llama herders. Uh, and again, they have this deep connection with the, with the environment and the earth. It was made for 2020, 2021, and now the current one for 2022. The dancers are uh, in Noche Luis Espejo, uh, a great uh, elder, as well as uh, Percy Gomez, who's one of his uh, students, who's also a painter. Uh, but they were made by Henry Bonilla and the other one by a collective, the, the aerial shots, a collective known as Raja Tabla. Thank you. Yes. Where can you learn your dad's dance moves? <laughs> yes, so yes, my, my dad, uh, has always been a, a great singer and dancer and musician, and he's a, he specializes in choir directing. Uh, they, they, he did a lot of the steps from the hija and uh, escaping there a little bit of zapateo, of waino or, or, or bailas that you might have seen. But yes, you're uh, Just invited us. to follow us uh, <laughs> or text us, message us on Instagram, and we're happy to to share that with you. It's part of our, our mission to to share. We have a uh, the foundation, as we have uh, a large group of children in our hometown of Jauja, in the Andes, that we teach um, uh, music to. Um, we use uh, whatever instruments we can find. We have violins, cellos, but we also have some charangos, guitars, and uh, quenas, and, and drums as well. So we're working hard to get those kids now to the music, the National Conservatory in, in Peru, now that they're the ones that are graduating. Uh, um, I, I wanted to say a, 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 um, one last thing. It's that sometimes we're like, uh, we uh, we see like the world being marvel at Machu Picchu and the Nazca lines, but there is, there is like a lack of connection between the inhabitants. We're still here, we're still building, we're still dancing, we're still creating, and we are part of that. You know, it, it, it doesn't, uh, it's not like uh, exclusive to only architecture, so that's why we, we, we put so much uh, effort in, in uh, performing and uh, practicing and also teaching to other people. So that's, uh, I think, a very um, important lesson that, you know, it, it's all part of like the same thing, no? So that's, that's it, thank you. Thank you. Any, any other questions? I think you had a follow up or anybody else? Yes. Yes, 
Yes, yeah, so we have, um, we have a community, especially a large community of Peruvians. We also have some, uh, uh, you know, Bolivians, uh, less so e Ecuadorians and Chileans that congregate, but in the Peruvian community, you're gonna find several uh, folkloric dance troops that specialize in different regions. Uh, so uh, we have Beatriz somewhere here who, whose mom and her specialize in the Highland dances. You can look them up also on, on Instagram as Sumach Tustui or, or reach out to us. And then we have the people who, who uh, specialize in the coastal dances. So you have uh, many different associations, Peru Danza, Club Libertad, etc. For Bolivian dances, uh, we have uh, the Masis group in, in Miami and I believe there's also Bolivia Magica here. But mostly also when we have the religious pilgrimages that people follow, such as El Señor de los Milagros in October, that congregates um, a large uh, group of people um, for, for the, the Peruvian community at least. Um, and then there's La Virgen de las Nieves, et cetera, for specific regions uh, where you can get a little bit of a uh, a taste if you can't travel to Peru or Bolivia or Ecuador just yet. I have a question for all of them. Oh yes, she has a question for you. How many have you seen the, the, the exhibit, the exhibition? How many of you went? Okay, almost everybody. <coughs> um, so yeah, I just wanted to, to, to tell you that uh, what my brother said, you saw the little ceramics of people playing flute and drums especially, and that was for us a connection between the worlds. I just urge you to look, if you're interested in Andean culture, just look for hashtags, look for us, and we'll connect you with your interest, but to the, to the whole population, just that connection and that dialogue with the cosmos that my mom is always emphasizing. It can happen to all of us, so just look more at the sky, as you see here, and please uh, go down to earth, with your barefoot and talk to your food because that comes from the earth. So in that way, we're all children of the earth and we are here in this native land that was first stepped on by the Tequesta and the Colusa, but we're here so we honor it every day. We live and we have a wonderful place where we are at. We have the, one of the most diverse places on the planet and we have one of the purest water so honor your water and honor the earth that you are stepping on and your food and look at the sky and the, and the, and the moon and the sun. We are the sunshine state. So in that way, and dance and be happy. That's what, what Suma Kausai meant, living well. Thank you. All right, folks, uh, let's get going. Uh, my name is Michael Harris. I'm the chair of the Department of Anthropology here at uh, Florida Atlantic University, and I've been here uh, many, many, many years. Uh, it's, as I mentioned before, this is a huge pleasure uh, to have spent the uh, afternoon with all of you, um, r really with a very stimulating uh, set of talks and um, music. And what we want to do now is to just offer to you a very brief 10 to 15 minute max uh, presentations from a few of the professors here at the university, uh, some in the Department of Anthropology here at FAU, um, from the Honors College at FAU, and uh, from the Department of Languages, Linguistics, and Comparative Literature here. Um, just briefly, um, just showing you really what our research is about and how we're operating uh, with regard to doing the kind of work that we're doing here locally. Um, it's really my pleasure, first of all, to introduce you to um, Professor Valentina Martinez, who's an instructor in the Department of Anthropology. She's an archeologist who's been working uh, for 25 years or longer at least along the coast of Ecuador, uh, investigating the development of uh, chiefdoms in the area of Manabí province. Uh, Professor Martinez.
thank you very much. As you already know, I'm going to pull you out of Peru for a little while and move you into a neighboring country, Ecuador, and in particular, the coast of Ecuador, where I have been following this prehistoric group known as the Mantenos. And as you can see in the map, the circle, the orange circle, that is the extent of their of, of, their, of where they settle. And I also put on this, on next to it, one of these very, uh, very well known uh, sculpted vessels of the Mantenos, because I want you to start to see their faces, their features, incredibly particular features. So the Mantenio population, or the Mantenio prehistoric group, was the last prehistoric group of coastal Ecuador. That means that they established contact with first the Incas, their neighbors to the south, and later on with the Spanish during the Spanish invasion. Uh, it, it is characterized, the Mantenio culture, by the presence of uh, many different polities. They are called chiefdoms. And the historical records written by early the Spanish mentioned at least four names of four major towns. As you can see in the, in the, in the slide, one of those towns is known as Salangome, which is uh, located uh, in, the, the, in the actual area where I work with uh, uh, Michael Harris and my brilliant students, and I'm so proud to be mentoring them. And uh, it, the town, the local town, is known as Salango. So one of my first uh, steps uh, was to, well, as if I want to understand how this uh, human group is, were able to settle in this area, the first thing that archaeologists would do is what we call a survey to find sites. And what you see there, it's the area where we work. Uh, we divided it in many different zones. And uh, each zone, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's drained by a particular river system. So the river systems usually gave us a pretty good idea where archaeological sites are going to be located. The Mantenos are characterized by, as I said, by building these incredible settlements. And in some of them, there is evidence of monumentality. But it's a different monumentality than the one that you have heard, the one in Peru. Those ones, we usually call it this a monumentality that it's, it's high. And uh, it is, uh, we call it vertical monumentality. But the monumentality that characterizes the Mantenio is an horizontal monumentality. That means that they are uh, very effective, were able to take this region that has many different environmental zones, and in each environmental zone, build a settlement. So uh, this survey took us like uh, 10 years of our lives, believe it or not. And uh, when we finished the survey, we were able to, to look at the distribution of archaeological sites across the landscape. As uh, this particular region is incredibly ecologically diverse. So it has many different environments. And we immediately understood that the settlements in each environment, it meant that they, uh, it, this, um, the Mantenos were able to specialize in the exploitation of a particular resource present in one of those ecological environments. Uh, I want you to pay attention to the sites. So those are the, all of those uh, uh, red triangles. And they notice that the sites are present everywhere. But to give order to that, uh, let me tell you that uh, sites are present along the coast, the shoreline. Sites are present in the inland. Inland areas are very good for agricultural activities. And then the big surprise, would be, and if you notice, there is an, a sites that become very increasing number in the inside that particular area is the cloud forest. So it, this was the first time that uh, we were able to identify a settlement in the cloud forest. Um, so to give you an idea as well of the times that we, we uh, we were able to date some of these sites, and now we can talk about a sequence, a chronology through time. And you know, through time, it means that we can start to talk about uh, changes and or continuities through time. So the early sites are more or less 725. The middle Mantenio sites are around 1,000, and the late Mantenio sites are around 1,400. Uh, 
one of the proposals that uh, we were able to, uh, uh, one of the arguments that we were able to build is that it is clear that Amantenos started a process of expansion to the rainforest at a very late time. Uh, to put this in a perspective with the Incas, we're talking about the time in which the Incas are starting their expansion from, from, from the highlands of Peru to the coast and to the north. And it's going to take them at least 30 years later to reach the region. Um, as I told you, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I'm very proud about our work is that we have been able to train and collaborate with the, with, with the students. And um, we, together with some of my students, uh, we immediately started to look at how these settlements were concentrated and how do they look on, uh, on the surface. So the sites that are located along the shoreline, very close uh, uh, on the coast, those are incredibly large settlements. Unfortunately, they, they have all been destroyed because of a, you know, urbanization today, modern development. However, we were able to find one early map created in the 1970s by archeologists, but they couldn't georeference this map. There was no way of doing that. And one of my students, Andres Garzon, was able to do that. And immediately we were able to see that all of those sites, Manteño sites, on the ocean front, they are monumental sites. And if you see at the map, it has clearly two areas. So there is a city center, and there are several, several residential areas. All of these structures, obviously, what, uh, what was the only uh, aspect that was visible of them was the stone foundations uh, which uh, re still remain there in some areas. This site in particular more or less have a date of a 1200 AD. Then come all of those sites in the inlands, in the inside. The ones that I'm telling you that uh, are smaller, they tend to have a lot of domestic activities and it seems to be the areas where farmers live. So this, uh, these sites are very important because obviously they were the ones producing food to support the larger centers. What you see in there, I wanted to show you, you know, we have a field school, so that means that we train students, and the students are, are, have the incredible opportunity to learn how to excavate, to recover data, and to interpret data. So the, the particular the particular photograph to the, to, to, the, to the left, that is showing you a buried vessel. And uh, this was very interesting because the, the pot tend to be very large. Uh, above, you can see the reconstructed one. And notice that the area of oxidation is outside, right? And uh, when we dug it all, we couldn't find any evidence of a fire outside. So we realized that the fire was inside. So it's, it works like an oven. It, like a typical oven today. However, this one is buried on the ground, and uh, this was the, the, the most popular way of preparing food for ancient uh, Mantenos. Uh, you know, after this, we started to move to the cloud forest, and uh, the map that you see there signaled that in the cloud forest, we have the highest population densities, not in the inland. They are even further in, in these higher elevated areas. The photographs signal there the type of evidence that we found. Those are stone foundations of, uh, of structures. They tend to be long, they, they are rectangular, and some of them tend to have, some of them have one room, some others have two rooms. Uh, this is the work of my, my student and colleague, Andres Garzon. Andres has developed the first typology of uh, these structures. And the uh, you know, ap apparently there is an incredible variability, but uh, I am going to summarize that in terms of uh, structures that are large, and other ones that are medium sized, and other ones that are small. The largest ones are more than 30 meters in length, and the smallest ones are something like 8 to 10 meters in length. So one of the questions that we had, why such variability? and why they are in the cloud forest, an area that it is, it, 
so difficult to leave. That area cannot sustain high population densities. So why all of a sudden, at 1400, the Mantenos decided to dominate the, the cloud forest and establish themselves there with such intensity? So we started to investigate the sites. We started to excavate some of the sites to be, to be able to have uh, those answers. You know, for example, site 84, those two stones that you see up here, that's the entrance to the site. So that suggests that these are sites that are important, that are big, that are complex, that, are, that uh, have a particular function. This is a mount, it's a natural mount, it's, it's on top of an alluvial terrace, and on top of the terrace they build their houses. So then what, once we were excavating the site, our students collected the data about a, uh, the size of the hub, the, the size of the structure, the details inside the structure, how the structure was built, and we were able to uh, it, it, we, were, we were able to understand that the houses were really not used for too long. People here do not live for more than 50 to 60 years. And that the last thing that they did before they, they abandoned the house was to bury it their loved ones, you know. The picture above to the right, you can see there some two circles. Those are large vessels that contain human remains inside. So it seems like the Mantenos, although builds an incredible complexity in the cloud forest, at some moment, they decided to abandon the area. Uh, this, is a, this is another site, very similar to the first one. You know, you can see on the picture to the right, uh, one, one, uh, a wall, and to the picture to the left, that is again a burial. That one we have not excavated yet. This is another one. This was interesting because we had this small uh, stone monolith uh, next to one of the buildings, and uh, we had two large structures here, more than 20 meters in length, each of them, and one, one very unique uh, finding, the, the picture in the middle below, that's a platform that it's all, it's, it has been put together by a very careful arrangement of stones. And when we were excavating the platform, then we realized that we have a vessel. You know, that's the different, different, different stages of excavation of the vessel. And, at, and obviously, we were able to collect a large amount of charcoal, and we dated the structure. So this is structure in particular, it is around 440 to 450. So still, we couldn't answer that question on what was the use of these structures. So then my students uh, decided to help. One of my students developed her, uh, her thesis trying to understand function based on the analysis of phosphate. And phosphate is an element that it's found in all uh, organic materials, and it leaves invisible traces on the soil. So she collected soil to be able to extract a, a phosphorus, and with that, she started to read the concentrations, high concentrations versus low concentrations. And uh, we proposed uh, the idea that, well, the structures that were very large with the highest concentrations of, of phosphates were used as a storage rooms. So it means that uh, for some period now, uh, the Mantenos understood the need to store food for the future. So obviously, we, are, we tied that immediately with the environment. Something was happening at the environmental level. And if you remember from the talk of Henry Tantalian, he suggested this is more or less the same time in which uh, populations on the coast of Peru were confronting environmental changes. So the idea was that the largest structures were used as storage rooms to store food, and the, and the smallest structures, the ones that were, are something like 10 meters long, they were used as uh, habitational spaces. So those were the houses. That, that's where people were, were living and sleeping. But you know, when you are going to propose an idea in archaeology, you have to make sure that that argument becomes very strong and that you're going to receive the same answer analyzing other, other uh, materials. So uh, another one of my students, Alex Bulis, uh, he decided to tackle the ceramics. And uh, uh, he, what he did is that 
that he did an analysis in the, uh, to try to make associations between the, the, the type of ceramics, right, and the number of ceramics versus the size of the structures. So the analysis showed that the maintain that this all of these uh, uh, ceramics present in these structures they tended to be more than anything else utilitarian. That's, that means for domestic activities. And then immediately we, he realized that the structures that are large do not have too many ceramics, and the structures that are small are full of utilitarian ceramics. So basically, the argument that this student proposed reinforced the, the argument of my earlier student. So now we can say with confidence, or with better confidence, that the structures, the larger ones, are storage rooms, and the smaller ones are domestic structures. So at the end of uh, once we finalize all of this survey and analyze all of these materials, we realize that, the, that the, all of the sites distributed in this particular region, they do refer to a, to a very unique chiefdom that the historical chronicles mention. This is the land of the Salangome, Salangome chiefdom. And uh, one of the activities that they became well known for is not only uh, because uh, they were able to establish uh, these large cities, but also because they were able to establish a very complex trade exchange with their neighbors to the south. So that means that during all these times, the Manteno started to exchange items uh, with, with, uh, with, with the cultures of Peru, not only in the coast, but in the highlands, such as the Incas. More than anything else, shells from the ocean, cotton from the mountains, right? Uh, copper from other regions. And so all of these important uh, uh, items were sent to uh, Peru. Uh, so the other question that I think, uh, in lieu of uh, the theme that uh, we have been following in this symposium, is obviously what is the relationship to the Incas? How did coastal Ecuadorians were able to establish uh, exchange with them? If we analyze uh, the Inca domination in Ecuador, in the highlands, for example, and then we compare it to the lowlands, we are going to see stark differences. In the highlands, when the Incas started their expansion, uh, throughout all of the highlands, more or less, that expansion began at around 1460, 1470, they, they imposed a new architectural style that it's seen in every single site in the highlands that was touched by the Incas. And here are some pictures of those sites. You know, Culebrillas, Pumapungo, Ingapirica, Mulajaló, Coyoctor. All of those are sites that were part of the Inca empire. And the first thing that is noticeable, noticeable is the architecture. It's typical uh, imperial architecture. That was, that was the style, was imposing local populations, and those local populations tended to replace their own uh, styles. The other, the other aspect of, of material culture of the Incas that is present in, in the populations that they conquered, obviously, are uh, the famous Aribalos and Queros. So if you look to the right, the two pictures above, those are Aribalos. And these are these uh, vessels with pointy days, long necks, and they were given as gift to local administrators throughout the conquered territory. So those Aribalos are present in every single region that the Incas entered. So they, are, they, they can be found throughout the highlands of Ecuador again. The other artifact is the ones below, the ones with that very flat bottom. Those are known as Queros, and it's, it's, it's the same. Aribalos and Queros were two of the most uh, typical uh, vessels given to local lords. Uh, to give a, sometimes uh, in, in the, at the local regions, uh, populations 
will take the shape of the arivalo, but they will change the decoration. And very typical is this one to the, to the, to the left, where you can see an arivalo in black. Right, that is a typical Chimu Inca black, uh, black arivalo. Chimu is one of the populations that the Inca conquered in northern Peru at around 1470. But none of these artifacts and none of the, the, the architecture that we see in the highlands of Ecuador are present in the lowlands of Ecuador. So obviously, we have to try to answer the question, what happened? What kind of relationships the Incas were able to establish in lowland Ecuador? And how all of these uh, uh, local uh, chiefs, all of these local lords, were able to negotiate their status and, and their presence in the region? Uh, I have to say that there is only one finding very close to the region that it's typical Inca, and that this, is, this was found in, a, in, a, in an island known as the Isla de la Plata that is off the coast of the region where we work. The person who did, who did this finding is George Dorsey at very early 1900, so that's the beginning of the 20th century. Unfortunately, we do not have the records of the excavation. Uh, I understand that the artifacts are located in the Chicago Field Museum, so obviously we are going to be visiting to, to, to look at that collection. And notice the findings, you know, they are very, very unique and very clear in terms of their origin. You know, there are some skeletons too, they're in bad shape, so the investigators couldn't say anything about the age or sex of these individuals. Two arivalos, two vessels, general vessels, and then plates that are typically Inca, and then a large variety of figurines in gold, in silver, etc. This is an Inca event. This represents an Inca event, but why is it on an island off the coast? Why we don't see it in any of the major local archaeological sites of uh, coastal Ecuador? And, and, and according to a first interpretation by McKeown and Silva, this burial is a ritual, and the burial is trying to is trying to delimit the northern border that the Incas are starting to establish in the Ecuadorian territory. According to McKeown, in all probability, this happened during the time of Topa Inca Yupanqui. Uh, that means circa 1470. So OK, so we understand that by 1470, the Incas are encroaching the territory. The Incas are trying to enter the lowlands. They have been incredibly successful in the highlands, so now it's time to take over over uh, the lowlands. However, remember that uh, some 50 years later, uh, well, uh, Peru, the, the elites of uh, Highland Peru are going to be immersed in an incredible fight over power. And at the same time, the Spanish are arriving. So it seems to me, and based on all of this investigation, that these local lords uh, were able to maintain their position. And it, obviously, it is very difficult to try to unravel the events of the, at the end of the 15th century and 16th century in coastal Ecuador, because we need to reconstruct it with the, the archaeology that we have and, obviously, the, the readings that we make of the historical documents. Uh, Henry Tantalian, in, in one of his publications, he does point out that, in all probability, the Incas were able to establish different strategies of uh, domination. So they will use one strategy of domination that, uh, in the areas that were already linked to the, to the empire. And obviously, different strategies, it, they are going to use different strategies in the areas that are going, in, in, where they are going to start their process of domination. Uh, regardless of this, well, these Manteno lordships, were, they managed, and they were able to maintain a certain independence. 
So that traffic, that long distance traffic and those in Manteno cities, they remain intact in all probability until very early 1500. Um, you might be wondering why do I have so many uh, pictures that depict all of these males and uh, where are the females? I have been wondering the same myself. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very telling that for Mantegna times, in particular these later times, all of the pieces, all of the sculpted pieces, and all of the figurines are representing males. So the next step in my investigation, uh, one of the next steps, is that I would like to revisit them because I'm interested in issues of gender and power and identity. And finally, I wanted to tell you that no, the Mantenos did not disappear, right? Not even with the Spanish invasion. Local populations managed to create the right social strategies to survive, to adapt, and to thrive. So, um, but that is a story about modern populations that is going to be in charge of some of my colleagues. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Martinez. Uh, we'd like to move in chronological order. Uh, next up is the Dean of the College, uh, Michael Horswell. He's also a, a professor of uh, Spanish literature, and he's going to deal with that horizon, um, the historic horizon with the arrival of the Spanish in the Chronicles and his research. Michael. Thank you, Mike. All right, let's see if, okay, I'll try to be brief. Let me just get this open real quick here. Okay, so I'm going to be kind of the um, odd person out today because I'm not going to be talking about ceramics or architecture or the wonderful archaeology that we just heard about that's just so fantastic. And by the way, Valentina, amazing work. 25 years is just rewriting, rewriting the history of, of that part of South America. I mean, truly, uh, your work and your students are so proud of our FAU students who have been writing theses. and and now doctoral dissertations on that work. So, and you've launched them into their careers and we're just so proud of that, thank you. Um, but, so I'm gonna talk about literature, history, uh, historical texts. So we're gonna talk about texts for a while and identities, um, subjectivities that start uh, really coming into being at this moment of contact after uh, the colonization begins. And we've heard different speakers today remind us of the incredible resistance, the incredible uh, vitality of the indigenous peoples of the Andes and how they have um, per, uh, you know, endured all and, and thrived. And we, you know, the, the Kuyaiki group, the Hurtado family is obvious evidence of the thriving of indigenous culture all the way to today. Um, but my topic is going to be about how uh, that indigenous culture starts to have to adapt uh, to the colonial colonization. Um, and I really want to privilege uh, really the agency of the indigenous folks who um, came in contact with the Spaniards uh, more or less from 1532 on. So real quick history reminder, the Pizarro clan and their group came into um, this area, you know, coming down the coast where Dr. where uh, Professor Martino was talking about and then coming into Peru. Uh, about 40 years of intense warfare took place and, 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 and military resistance by part, on the part of the Incas and other ethnicities. When we talk about the Andes, yeah, let me go back to my map. Um, you remember there are multiple ethnicities, even though the Incas were dominant there in those last hundred years before the arrival of the Spaniards, uh, they were still contesting in Ecuador, as we just heard, and other uh, edges of their of their empire. Um, so. But there is this war of, of, of conquest and resistance. And by the 1570s, the Spaniards and the other Europeans begin to really consolidate power. And so at that point, we've had 40 years of contact, if you will. Uh, 40 years of the Spaniards introducing their language, their customs, their religion, uh, mostly by force. Uh, uh, in, the, in the late uh, 1500s, uh, you know, schools are established for the elite indigenous, uh, mainly boys. Uh, very few women got this education until later, but the indigenous boys were starting to be educated, being taught uh, Latin, uh, Spanish, but also taught 
to write down their own languages. So Quechua starts being written down in an alphabetic way um, and uh, using Latin grammar as a basis, of course, from the priests from Europe who came over uh, to do that. And this was all part of the evangelization uh, of this space in these first uh, 50, 70 years. Um, and the big, the big push was to extirpate everything we've talked about today. So all the wonderful worldview that you heard about uh, in, the, in the talks before, uh, religious practices, you might call them, um, uh, had to be extirpated so that Catholicism could be implanted. And so that extirpation, there were actually campaigns that uh, required that, that recruited indigenous uh, elites, uh, particularly those who were starting to be schooled in writing and reading, um, to help the priests uh, figure out where the, for example, the wakas, we've heard a lot about the wakas, these, you know, the monumental spaces um, where uh, the burials were. Um, the burials we've heard were so important because of ancestor worship and uh, respect for the ancestors. The Spaniards weren't, Spaniards weren't interested in that, they were interested in all those gold pieces that we saw this morning um, that they could take out of those tombs, right? And so the, the extirpation had a religious reason, but also very much an economic reason because that gold was getting and you, it's going to kill you, uh, you saw how beautiful it is, um, was getting melted down and, and, and shipped back to, to Europe. And of course that gold is what uh, finances um, the expansion of the Spanish Empire at the time and other European empires as that gold uh, you know, fuels the economy of Europe uh, into the uh, 17th century. So all this is happening and writing gets introduced into the Andes, uh, alphabetic writing. We've, sh we've seen all day how the Andeans had other ways of communicating their belief systems, their values, their, uh, their uh, history through ceramics, uh, through uh, monumental architecture, and, um, and of course other ways. Um, but it's the writing that then leads to uh, what we might call literature, uh, which is definitely a Western notion that is introduced. It's, and I'm gonna argue that it's a clash between these two systems, the systems we've been studying today, and of course the books and alphabet, alphabetic writing. Um, those of you who are at the museum this morning, you'll remember that beautiful example of the quipu as you walk into the Machu Picchu area. Um, and so the quipus, of course, was one of the uh, root systems uh, in the Andes that went back many generations on how to record um, history, um, also other stories, etc., and of course data. And um, so, I might, you know, that, and the wonderful oral tradition that we see in Kuyaki's uh, songs uh, that they've researched and pulled forward into the present, for example, that comes together with books, that comes together with writing systems. Um, and as that comes together, I will argue that what, what we know of the new subjectivities, that is, the new way that the Andean people begin relating to others and themselves, it starts getting expressed in writing. And so for the first time, uh, we, can, we can actually read uh, the testimonies of Andean peoples in an alphabetic writing that we can still have access to. So I, in my work, I theorize you know, what this looks like for someone to live in between cultures in, this, in these early years. And I use a Quechua term, chaupi, which is that middle, that middle space in a symmetrical, or in, in, a, in a textile or other parts of uh, you know, the, the sacred space of the Andes is always mm, kind of these complementary spaces. And there's always this mediating space in the middle called the chaupi, the chimu, depending on the language. And that space, uh, I use as sort of a metaphor to think about the Andeans living on the spectrum between cultures, uh, maybe completely indigenous and completely out of touch with the Spanish uh, if they could have get, gotten far enough away, all the way to a spectrum in which they are uh, adopting and adapting um, the Spanish customs and beliefs, etc. So that make, makes writing super interesting in this period, and this is what I study. Um, so the, the books that start coming out in the 1560s, uh, 70s, 80s um, become uh, really rich uh, examples of um, both indigenous people and mestizos. Mestizos would be the mixed folks because obviously uh, the people start mixing uh, as well. Um, and the, they write not just in Spanish and in sometimes Latin, but in Quechua because they've had that alphabet now written down and so they write in their own languages, uh, also Aymara. Um, and they use that writing to record their own histories record all the intricacies of, of uh, the, the histories between the different ethnic groups of the Andes and, and of 
course, the more recent history of the, of the colonization from the, from the Europeans, but they also use that writing to contest the writing of the Spaniards because the first wave of writing is mainly uh, Spanish priests and, and soldiers who are writing chronicles and early histories. Um, the indigenous folks, after learning to read the, those texts, read them and start writing back, contesting what they say, uh, 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 contradicting what they say as a way to recreate themselves and their cultures um, and express their own self-interests and their community's interests. So I only have time to talk about one person. The students in the room could have predicted this. This is my favorite author of this time. You heard him spoken of, uh, or, and you saw his drawings um, all over the museum. You've seen his drawings <laughs> illustrating some of the talks today. And um, that's a lot of folks use Guaman Poma de Ayala's uh, uh, book, which is a thousand page uh, chronicle history. It's a real hybrid text. Um, they use it um, because it, had, it came with 600 words of text, and I'm sorry, 600 pages of text, and about 400 line drawings that represented the history of the Andes as well as the history of the colonization and uh, other commentary. So quickly, uh, Guaman Poma, a one amazing figure, an indigenous person, an Andean um, with a very complex background. I'm going to try to share a little bit of that. I don't have time to really go into de de detail, um, but uh, he was known as a Latino at that time, as a Christianized indigenous indigenous person who has gone through the catechisms, had learned Catholicism at some level, mm, always a question of how, uh, you know, uh, faithful uh, they are to that dogma, um, but also literate. You know, they've become writers, they've become uh, able to read and, and write. And in the case of Guaman Poma, uh, Spanish Quechua Aymara at least, probably Latin as well. Um, and uh, we know very little about him. What we do know is from the book itself and from a couple of um, interesting uh, court cases he was involved in. But he lived in this contact zone, this in-between zone, I would argue. But he did, in his early life, go to work for the Spaniards, um, as it was really one of the only opportunities to have an intellectual life was to work with the Spaniards at that time. But otherwise, you were you know, paying tributes, you were working in the mines, you were working if you were an indigenous person in, in, after colonization. So this was a one way for the intellectuals of, this, of, of the Andeans to, to work um, in the life of the mind. So he worked as a translator and an illustrator uh, for Spaniards for a period of time. And we know a lot about him because of the way he self-represents. In other words, he puts himself into the story. And this is really my favorite, some of my favorite parts of his, his work. He had a wonderful sense of humor, uh, as, we, as you can see. But he also had a keen eye to injustices, and a keen eye to denouncing what was happening in his, in his place of, of, of origin. And um, I should have said this book, this 1,000-page page book, uh, was actually in the form of a letter letter, a letter to the king. So he had the, also the audacity to write straight to the king. And we think we, he probably wrote to the king more than once, but this is what survives. Um, and uh, it's a letter, it's a chronicle, it's a history. It's really a polemic telling King Philip III, who was the, the monarch at the time, um, all the things that were going wrong in his native Peru. Um, so you see him there kind of putting himself in the, in the, far, the far right uh, drawing, uh, putting himself in front of the king, kind of imagining uh, an audience with the king. And, also, and then there's a, a textual section in which he gives uh, counsel to the king. So this is quite something. You know, an indigenous person that quite frankly d did not have any very little status at this point in his life, uh, but had learned the, the, the tools of empire, you know, especially writing, uh, deciding to write back uh, to the king of Spain, the most powerful monarch at that time. Um, so he creates this persona for himself and for his ancestors. We've heard today a lot about how important that is. So he creates a, 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 a grandfather and a father. You know, he claimed his father was number two of the Inca, uh, an ambassador to the Spaniards when they arrived. Uh, he, he claimed his father fought against one of the infamous, infamous um, traitors to the crown, uh, Gonzalo Pizarro. Uh, he uh, then goes to great lengths throughout the book to remind the king that he was loyal to the crown. Now remember, and this is an indigenous person who has, who has really suffered greatly, uh, especially towards the end of his life, because of colonization, which I'll talk about in a second. But he's going to self-represent because he knows he, that is the way to get his message across to the king, by claiming this loyalty to the crown and to the church. 
And then, as I said, he offers himself up as a royal uh, counselor. Now, you know, a lot of people th um, don't know this, but the, the indigenous people uh, right away learned the court systems. The Spain, Spain had put in a really elaborate court system um, really early in the, in the, in the, in the um, colonization. And so he tried to use the court, uh, the Spanish courts to reclaim family lands in the area of Peru called Ayacucho. Um, his court case, we believe, was in the 1590s um, and before writing the thousand page book. Um, but he lost. And the people that won the claim, in other words, that kept his so-called his family lands, we're not 100% sure they were his family lands, but he certainly claimed it, was a group called the Chachapoyas, which is another ethnic group who did ally with the Spaniards, and the Spaniards basically honored their claims instead of Guam and Palma's claims. We think that this probably influenced the way he wrote the book and maybe even why he wrote the book. Um, and, uh, and so, but we did, and so for a while, Scholars weren't sure if the, any of this was real, but then uh, a, a few decades ago, we did uh, a scholar did find um, the court cases uh, in, the, in the in the archives. This is the map of his family's lands as he drew them, uh, saying, you know, and and it's interesting. We heard a lot about water and the control of water today, and the dispute of lands was about the control of water. So he he had claimed that his family controlled uh, certain irrigation uh, uh, rivers. Um, he invented a grand this grandfather. And, and, and drew him um, as, a, as a senior of this area, um, quite uh, adept at learning how to represent. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit of this. This is one of my favorite drawings of his. Um, this is the first page of the book, the thousand page book, and you'll see, um, you know, three uh, 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 heraldic uh, shields there. Um, the, the top one, uh, of course, is the, the Pope. Um, so that's the papal shield, uh, the Pope on his throne. Um, the next is, uh, is the King of, of Spain, and of course the, shield, the, the heraldic shield of, the, of Spain. Um, note that the King in that second position has his crown, you know, sitting there uh, uh, as he, has, he takes the crown off in reverence to the Pope. And Woman Poma there is on the bottom. So the last person is actually our author, and I'm going to zoom in on that because it just shows, you know, certainly a sense of humor, a sense of irony, but also audacity. Now he's now putting himself more or less at the same level as the king, right? Saying that, and it, and it kind of jives with the rest of his book because the overall thesis he proposes to the king is that he, Guam and Palma, should be the prince of Peru should take over the, uh, the the running of it because the Spaniards have done such a horrible job at it. And so um, you see, instead of a crown, he puts his little hat there in front of uh, of him, just as the king had his crown. He created a, a you know a crest, which didn't exist, of course, in the Andes, using uh, figures and motifs from uh, Andean culture that we've talked about today. You, you, can, you can read this as Anan and, and Kaipa, Anan Pacha and Kaipacha and Orca Pacha, as we discussed uh, in other lectures, um, and even created a seal. If you know anything about Spanish bureaucracy, even to this day, everything has to be stamped, right? And so back in the colonial days, uh, the stamp, the seal was very important. So he creates all this fictionally, of course, um, in order to create the authority to speak to the king. And real quickly, I don't have much time, but I just, you know, this is just a wonderful book. I want you all to go read it. Um, it is on, it is digitized online at the Copenhagen um, uh, uh, library. So you just put in Guama Pomayala, it comes up, it's a wonderful resource because all thousand pages are there. You can search it, you can, uh, you know, it has uh, search capabilities and you can appreciate, appreciate both the line drawings and the, the text. But the book has three parts basically. The first part is the history of the Andes. But notice how, again, he wants to make the argument that the, that the Spaniards were the traitors to the true Christians. So he goes through this elaborate uh, process of putting Andeans into universal Christian history. So you'll recognize the folks here on the left as Adam and Eve from the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, yet, lots of Andean motifs, sun and the moon in the top. You, you have the, um, the, the plow, the, the um, Chakitakya, which is in Quechua is the foot plow, uh, that is the agricultural instrument uh, par excellence in, in the Andes from time immemorial even to this day. So he adds the Andean elements to it, but all, and so this is what I mean by you know inserting the Andeans and uh, the Andean people into this universal Christian history. Um, 
and um, and he and he also you know kind of buys in and and, and, and talks to about a, a sort of an evolutionary notion of the of the Andean people. So he talks about the sort of savage Andeans and then the civilizing Andeans being the Incas. Um, uh, in, in that section of the book, he, he, he really records a lot of uh, customs and traditions. Many of the interpretations you heard today were informed by his book and his drawings because scholars, even looking at the real ancient past, they really need to think, because it's, you don't have a first person narrative and, you know, before the Spanish arrive, so now you do with a Guam and Poma. Is he completely trustworthy? Is it all factual? That's you know sort of the work of scholars to kind of figure out. But you know you have the ancestors, um, and and uh, I think someone today talked about uh, that exact uh, drawing, uh, and many other uh, festivals. But then his second part, he gets into the colonization and the, and the so-called conquest, um, and so he represents. You know I'm going to talk about the middle figure. I think the most today, so they don't have much time. This is Santiago. Um, this is uh, St. James, uh, he's a patron saint of Spain. He always appears in battles, especially if the Spaniards were about to lose to the Mor when they were battling the Muslim uh, to reconquest Spain in the, in the, um, in the, in the late Middle Ages. Uh, Santiago would appear, and, um, and he was in Spain, he's represented in iconography as always on a white horse, stepping on the head of a Muslim, a Moor. Um, in the Andes, uh, in so Guam Poma, we know, knew this iconography because he was, he's reproducing it, but he's changing it. Now, this is Santiago Mata Indios, Santiago uh, Killer of Indians, and the in indigenous person, the Inca, there underneath the horse. So now, if you go to the Andes, almost any place where they represent Santiago from those times, you'll find this representation of Santiago on, the, um, uh, on top of the uh, indi indigenous person. So, um, you know, he, he tells the whole story of that colonization, of that the military part, as well as once uh, power is consolidated by the Spaniards, he's, he also records the abuses of the people. So here are a couple of examples of the critique that he offers to the king of how his officials, the king's officials, are treating the people in his country. Now, um, he has quite a few about the sexual abuse of women, um, uh, the abuse in the different workspaces like Los uh, Obrajes, which were the textile mills, if you will, at the time. He has a big section on the mines and what, how many you know, thousands of indigenous people were dying in the mines. Um, and then the last section is uh, is really something I've been working on a lot lately. Um, it's sort of a final supplement and that we know that he added at the very end before he sent the book off to uh, Spain. Uh, he did literally send the letter to the king um, and we know it arrived in um, Europe. We just don't know if the king ever read it. Um, but in this third part, he has walked all the way from the highlands to Lima. Um, and he sees the measure of his people. So remember, the population decline was radical, uh, from you know millions of Andeans down to hundreds of thousands in the, the period of time of the colonization of those first 70 years I've been talking about. Mainly disease, but also from uh, casualties of war. Um, and so this final lament is is quite poetic, uh, and uh, in, a, in a very kind of sad way, um, but also really drives home his final point to the king um, that everything is kind of turned up to, upside down. Uh, he documents his abuses, as I said, and then he um, you know, gives the king a bunch of recommendations, and um, we'll never know if, uh, if anyone over in the court ever actually paid attention to them. But the refrain, el mundo está al revés, the world is upside down, um, it brings him to advocate for a reordering of the Andean world. Um, he denounces, curiously enough, uh, miscegenation, uh, in other words, mixing, uh, racial mixing. Uh, he advocates for the separation of the races. By that prime time, uh, African slaves have been brought in as well. Um, he blames, uh, uh, this is always uh, uncomfortable, but he does blame the lascivious indigenous women for partnering with men, uh, and Spanish men. Um, but he equally also condemns the, the scrupulous Spaniards for the for the uh, the abuse and the rape and the uh, uh, pillage of, of of the women as well. So um, you know it's, he has a, a bunch of different sides to him. And then his final disillusionment um, at this at the end of the book, you know, he basically says, uh, "No hay remedio. There is no solution. What are we to do?" Um, 
And uh, this, this last, one of the last sentences uh, has always been very poignant for me. Um, he says, and I apologize, this is my translation. As a prince of the Indians of this kingdom, I have suffered so much poverty while having worked 30 years in service of God and your majesty. And I journey through this kingdom and I write this history so that it be remembered and stored in the archives in order that justice be served. For me, that says it all about this process of, of uh, the new subjectivity of, of an indigenous person learning to use the tools to fight for justice for his, his own people. Uh, in this case, the tool of writing and representation. The last word, the actual, the literally, this is the page, the last page of that 1,000 page book. Um, you can see it's truncated. We don't know what the rest of it would have said. But the last uh, sentence ends, escribir es nunca acabar. To write is to never finish. And I think it's uh, possible to take that as an invitation for future generations to continue writing back to power and fighting for justice. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Horswell. Well, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Rachel Kaur, cultural anthropologist from uh, the Wilkes Honors College here at FAU, um, longtime scholar, researcher uh, from uh, the highlands of Ecuador in the community of Salasaka. Thank you. Do you know how to get this to uh, put on? Oh, I see. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk today about death rituals in the highland. Ecuadorian indigenous community of Salasaca, where I did field work between 1991 and 2015. I was there most recently in 2020, March, when the COVID, when COVID was announced as a global pandemic, and so I haven't been back since. But today I'm going to focus on connections through time with the pre-Columbian Andes, um, based on three themes: textile symbolism, games of chance played at funeral wakes and um, crossroads as they relate to the concept of tinkoi, which there was a little bit of information about today in the exhibit. So Salasaca is located right in the central Andes of Ecuador in the province of Tungurawa, and it's about 9,000 feet above sea level. The population is about 8,000 people, and around 3,000 of them now live in the Galapagos Islands, where they migrated uh, in search of better paying jobs. The language, the first language is Quechua, which is related to Quechua, the language spoken by the Incas. And most people are bilingual in Quechua and Spanish. And the religions include, uh, as Dr. Horswell was saying, this syncretic blend of native Andean religion and Catholicism. There is a very small number of Protestants in the community, mostly evangelical Christians. But I'm going to focus today on the rituals of the um, people who practice native Andeanism mixed with Catholicism. Salasacas distinguish themselves traditionally through their ethnic attire, which are long black wool ponchos for men and long black wool skirts for women. And I just want to say the women, it's a wraparound skirt, and they make these beautiful folds in the skirt, which they call wachos. That's the same term for the um, folded ditches in a planted field that the water flows through. So I thought of that today when Mary Weissmantle was giving her talk about 
the importance of, of flows and water. And so same term um, for the women's skirts as those um, ditches in the fields for the water to flow. And then the women also have these beautiful uh, woven belts called chumbis with uh, beautiful designs. And these are woven by men for women on the backstrap loom. So the first thing I want to talk about is after a person dies and it's announced over the loudspeaker and all the kin and ritual kin like godparents are announced, um, the next night they have the wake and people come and they play a game of chance called Wairu. And so this shows, this is a Salasaka Wairu that somebody made and um, let me photograph. It's like a die, it's a game piece. It is played by men who are not directly related to the deceased, and the reason is that the soul is still hovering around at the wake, and if the direct uh, family members play, the soul might want to take the person with them, and they could be next to die. So the immediate family does not play, but people not related to the deceased play this game. It is the obligation of the son-in-law of the deceased to provide the game piece. So that's one of his obligations to the family that he marries into. He has to rent it from one of the families that owns it, and he's responsible for it during the funeral and the wake. During the game, um, it's only played by adult men, and the reason is the players slap each other's hands during the game. They don't want to slap women and children, so traditionally only adult men play this game. The player who tosses the higher number slaps the hand of the man who tosses the lower number hard, and he you know, winces in pain, and it's part of the, the humor also that takes place during the wake. There are mentions of this game in um, ethno-historic ethno sources, so there are references to it being played in pre-Columbian times in different parts of the Andes. And um, some of the past reasons that were given for the game is that it was a form of divination. You could pose questions to the deceased and toss it to see, to, to divine the will of the deceased. Uh, it was a way of dividing up property. And in general, it was a way of communicating with the deceased. It was also played in some parts of the Andes during times of transition, rites of passage like death, so it makes sense to play it at a funeral wake because it's a rite of passage from this life to the afterlife. Um, but it was also um, marked transitions like changes of political office. When I asked Salasakas their own reasons, their explanations for why they have to play this game at the wake of every deceased adult, most of them said it's tradition, but one elder man who's knowledgeable in the um, explanations of why people do things and in the history of the community said it pleases the soul to have the living play this game at the wake. It makes the soul happy. So that was the explanation that I was given. This is a picture from the Museum of the City in Quito um, in the pre-Columbian section. So these are pieces found by archaeologists that look very much like the Salasaka Wairu that's played today at funeral wakes. So I just wanted to show that um, connection with the pre-Columbian exhibit. So clothing expresses people's relationship to the deceased at death. The first thing I want to talk about are these brown hats that are only worn during funerals and only by people related by blood or adoption or the actual spouse. But the other in-laws, other people related by marriage, don't wear them. And so in this picture, this man in the middle who's not wearing a hat is married to the sister of the deceased. And although he was very close to the deceased, he does not wear the mourning hat, but his wife, his daughter, and his son do wear them. The second piece of clothing that's used in funerals are the beautiful chumbis, the women's belts wrapped around the coffin. It's also used to lower the coffin into the grave. And it is the obligation of the daughters-in-law to lend their belts for use in the funeral. So just as the son-in-law has his obligation to provide the die, the game piece, the daughter-in-law uh, lends her, her belt. The daughters-in-law lend their belts for the funeral. And then it takes a long time to dig, dig the grave, so there's a lot of chatting back and forth in the cemetery. But then when the coffin is actually lowered into the grave, um, people in charge of collecting the women's belts take them to give back to the daughters-in-law. And then the mood turns very, very sad, and people begin to cry, throw dirt on the coffin. 
and sometimes uh, a woman might ritually wail. And the first time I heard this at a funeral, I thought that she was singing. And when I asked about it, people told me she wasn't singing, she was crying. But it was a very poetic crying where it's, you know, there was a tone to it. And she, for example, they would say, my dear little neighbor, now that you're gone, who will plow your fields? Who will weave clothing for your family? And so these poetic laments at the funerals fall along um, gendered lines, depending on the tasks that typically fall to men or women. After the burial, there's another ritual called the uku pichana. It's cleansing the inner room or cleansing the house. And it takes place on the third day after the burial. And they, the pallbearers come with medicinal plants, the same medicinal plants that are used in healing. And they sweep up any dirt, um, straw from the person's bed, old tattered clothes. They sweep these up. They take them to a crossroads and burn them. And one man told me, this means that the, de that the deceased is really gone now, even his trash. So this also connects. We, we have some. Um, ethno-historic references about old pre-Columbian traditions that relate to this, and it connects to the concept of tinkoi, the, the coming together of opposites. So the Inca would throw the remains of sacrificial offerings into the confluence of rivers, which they called the tinkoi, and it's not just the coming together of opposites, it's the, also the mediation of opposing forces. And also early colonial ancestor cults, um, on the fifth day after death, they would, the kin would come and sweep out the home of the deceased and throw the belongings into a ravine. So uh, the concept of tinkoi, whether it's two rivers coming together or crossroads, represents not just the mediation of opposing forces, but the way Salasakas use crossroads, it's also a place of mediation between worlds, upper and lower worlds, like we saw in the exhibit today. And so uh, I just want to end by talking about some recent changes uh, in the death rituals um, due to both migration, international migration, as well as some neo-Andean rituals that connect people both to their past as well as to other Andean indigenous people. Um, this picture was sent to me over social media. My friend sent it over WhatsApp of the funeral of my friend Sixto Masakisa who had migrated to New York years ago and unfortunately was one of the early victims of the COVID pandemic. Um, sadly, he died in a hospital in Brooklyn. And so his family had to make arrangements to have his remains cremated and sent back home. And so the actual funeral did not take place until November of 2020. And um, this is different from a lot of the funerals that I saw during my field work, and it represents some of the new rituals that people are creating. So this is sort of a neo-Andean, pan-Andean ritual. You can see food offerings here, photographs of the deceased, and um, it was mentioned earlier, the rainbow flag, which uh, was invented in Peru in the 20th century to represent the four quarters of the Inca Empire. And so this has become a pan-Andean symbol for um, Tawantinsuyo, right, for the four quarters of the Inca Empire, and, and represents people's connection uh, to the past. And I was told that the family um, purchased a coffin anyway and placed uh, his ashes inside the coffin and buried it in the cemetery. So it remains to be seen uh, how, what people will continue to keep as um, older traditions like their grandparents celebrated, and then how things will change not only with international migration, but also with these neo-Andean, pan-Andean rituals that connect people to other Andeans and to their pre-Columbian past. Thank you. Harris, there you go. Do you want to do a slideshow? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, I'm Michael Harris, as I've already mentioned, uh, cultural anthropologist, right right and um, I'd like to briefly describe the kind of work that I do um, in coastal Ecuador. Uh, part of a project that's a regional project that attempts to put together how people today, with contemporary ways of life, uh, how people subsist today. 
to take that information and then to project back into the past and connect that to how people prehistorically um, subsisted. So the idea with regard to the project that I've been working on for now 25 years uh, in conjunction with Professor Martinez has been an explicit uh, attempt to link the prehistoric to the historic and then to contemporary culture. And I won't have the time here to go through all of what I want to say. But what I want to make sure that I stress is that we're interested in a regional perspective, one that moves from the Pacific Ocean to the beach, to inland terraces, to dry forest, into tropical cloud forests, and how people in the past interacted through all of these different ecosystems and how they continue to interact today. The thing to remember with regard to looking at a map like this is that one can move from deep ocean to shallow ocean to beach to dry forest and then into cloud forest with just about 30 minutes of walking from the beach interior. And one of the enduring interests that I've had is how do people use the different resources in each of the different ecosystems that are available to them now and what do we know about that in the past. A critical method that I've used in order to carry out a lot of this research is um, through training students. And um, we attract students from all over the United States, uh, occasionally from Europe or Australia or New Zealand as well, who join us during the summer and we set them on projects. The kinds of projects that I'm concerned with are contemporary culture. They might include anything from agriculture to fishing, to healthcare, to childbirth, to the role of women, to religion, uh, you name it. Uh, we basically take a look at it in the context of a small Ecuadorian region or, in some cases, just a village. One of the things that people do today is they react to the past. One of the things that they do today in a place like coastal Ecuador, in the village that we work primarily called Salango, is they find remnants of prehistoric cultures right under their feet. You don't really have to kick very much dirt away in order to uncover an, uh, an archaeological object, a piece of ceramic. And so people are always constantly confronted with this idea of the prehistoric past, and they're standing right on top of it. And yet, in this coastal region, there's really no story of continuity that connects the people of today to that deep prehistoric past. We know from archaeology, 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, all the way up to today, that people have been living in this area one cultural sequence after another. That's what the archaeologists put together. But the people of today along the coast, it's as if history has been torn, that there's a gap between the prehistoric past and today. And part of what we're doing is attempting to fill in that prehistoric past. After all, they're standing on top of it fill in what that depth of history is, fill in what recent history was, and provide people, in a sense, with a depth of history. And history in itself, a sense of your own history and the depth of your history, is what really provides a community with a sense of identity, with a sense of security, and I dare say even with a sense of its own power. So that's basically our goal. People look at what's happened in the past. There are these representations of people right in this area at the time that the Spanish and just shortly after came who were balsa raft builders and traders who were known to take their balsa rafts all the way down to Chile or north to the coast of Mexico. But the people who are living today in the region have only what's presented to them in 
archaeology and through historical museums to build that and react to that kind of past. And what we see then today is that in contemporary culture, people take images from the past and they recreate them for themselves. The balsa of the past and the balsa raft of today carried out really as a celebration for the Dia de la Raza or uh, what people here would celebrate as Columbus Day. The people in the region as well pick up these ceramics and everyone has beautiful pieces because they're living on top of an incredible depth of cultural material and begin to connect themselves to that prehistoric past. It's not that what you're seeing in the photos of the people there is actually some kind of historic or traditional ritual that they're carrying out. What you're seeing there is a contemporary interpretation of what people believe their ancestors were like based on the material that they find and what people like anthropologists like us have been able to put together and to make available to them. We've been involved in the creation in the middle photo below of a prehistoric museum that basically tells the story of the region's prehistory from 5,000 years ago up to the time that the Spanish arrived. And then in the photo right above that, that blue and white house, to write the history of the last 100 years, their history. And that history then becomes something that the elderly interpret and that the young begin to learn. And this is part of the thing that's really interesting to me is that culture ultimately, right, is something that we're always really creating. A sense of identity is always something that's in the process of becoming. Your identity is not only a link to the past, a link to a common blood, a link to a common language, or a national origin, but your identity is also about you interacting in the world now with your goals, with other people, and with the opportunities that are presented to you. What I'd like to do now is just briefly take you sort of on an ethnographic tour or trip that illustrates what really motivates me, I think, in anthropology, and that's the description of what people are doing in order to make sure that they have life. It's this incredibly basic and simple question. How do people use environments in order to get the things that they need in order to continue their lives? So I focus on how people in the, late, in the region utilize the dry forest, the forest that's most close to the coast. And that forest can be used for a variety of agricultural products as well as other kinds of products that can be used in all parts of life. The yellow flowers that you see are associated with a tree called bujujo, which is used as a paste and a glue to keep things together. And then we move into the cloud forest, the humid forest, which, as I said, just takes 30 minutes to get to walking from the coast. And what are people doing there? It appears the cloud forest to many, I don't know, Western eyes or American eyes, that that's just pure and utter wilderness. But actually, uh, to a person from that community, that is a cultivated piece of ground, a piece of ground from which uh, food, medicine is coming from. And that's the kind of thing that I try to focus on. How do people use this dry forest? How do people use this humid forest? And what do they use it for? For example, 
in the humid forest, the canyabrala, or a species of bamboo, can be used really simply in order to construct really a pretty nice house, in my opinion. Maybe not yours from Boca. Uh, <laughs> but I'm interested as well, what kinds of resources are coming out? What resources do people bring out of these environments? The red fruit that you see in the upper left, cacao for chocolate, corn to the right, drying, plantain, heavy carbohydrate, and bottom right, manioc or juca. And manioc is this incredible crop that's drought resistant, that doesn't need much water, but which can also survive lots of water. So it's this kind of crop that you can put in the ground and plant simply, and it grows. You pull up the roots, and those roots become the tubers that you eat. So I'm interested in putting together how people pull together all of these different resources in order to meet their needs. And where they get their protein from. Since we're on the coast, all of this protein, virtually all of their protein, comes from the ocean, from coastal villages. And these coastal villages have been around, really, as continuous developments, I think, for 5,000 years or so, uh, based on fishing, based on collecting. Um, and fishermen go out every night. They fish according to the phase of the moon. When the moon is at its darkest phases, they're out fishing all night. When the moon is waxing at its brightest phases, they don't fish. They stay on shore and don't go out. And every morning then, when they are out fishing, they bring the catch in. Everyone shows up on the beach. People hang out. They laugh. They talk. If someone just grabs a side of a, of a boat, of a canoe, or, or, a, or a panga, they call it, um, if someone just grabs a side just to help to stabilize it as it's sitting there on the beach, they get a fish. Everyone gets a fish. Just about everyone gets a fish. And the elderly, the fellow walking away there on the, uh, on the far side, uh, has just gotten his fish uh, for the day. But people on the coast also today continue to use other forms of subsistence than fishing. And they do something that's really quite uh, simple, and that's just collecting along the shoreline, especially the rocky parts of the coast. People go out in the morning, early, sometimes whole families, sometimes groups of young people or the elderly, and they search through the rocks. And they come up with lobster. There's a lobster in there. They come up with octopus. And they come up with a whole variety of uh, bivalves, things like oysters or some kind of clam. Uh, and these typically then go into uh, local soups. So my job as an anthropologist, I think, is basically to, to bear witness, to record, to document what people do today. And my hope is that the archaeologists in 2,000 years um, will find that helpful. Ultimately, all of these foods are brought together for food, well, for meals, to feed the family, for the sustenance of the people themselves in their villages, living their lives, playing sports, raising children, or riding their motorcycles uh, through the village, or playing on the beach. So as an anthropologist, I'm interested mostly in understanding what people do today. And what do people do today, especially 
in order to sustain life? And I feel that this is a critical question for uh, all of our futures, really, when it comes down to it. Um, what do people do? I'm actually fairly optimistic that all of us somehow will adapt. But with that, I want to end my talk. And if anyone has any comments or questions for the assembled uh, scholars, please feel free to respond. Thank you very much. has been a long day. <laughs> and I want to tell you all how appreciative we are that you all have stuck it out and stayed with us uh, you know, since 11 AM and some of you since 8.30 AM. Um, it's been an incredible day. So thank you all very much for coming. And we hope to see you back at FAU soon. We've got an amazing slate of, of Music, entertainment, scholarship, sir. What the fuck? You beat me to it, sir. I was going to thank you for spending, to all of you, for spending an afternoon of your precious time telling us about these very interesting subjects. Unfortunately, not enough people, not, not students, they're free, they didn't come here, they missed a lot. A uh, couple, couple of comments. I don't know if you heard me. Yes. Okay. Anyway, a couple of comments. It has to do with, uh, first of all, uh, I believe there is uh, in Waman Poma de Ayala's uh, slice a, a misspelling of one of his books. It spells uh, C-R-O-N-I-C-A, Chronica. I, has, I think it has an extra O. So for the sake of people that want to, to get it, it, check the spelling. It's a misspelling, nothing important at all. But that's the best presentation of what Mom Palmas I've ever seen. And that, let me tell you, as a Peruvian, that's the, one of the most interesting readings that we can get in our history classes. However, it's almost impossible to obtain the real book with all the drawings and everything. It's almost impossible, it's very pricey, and one of my questions was is, where can I see the whole book? Thanks. Yes? Hello? Hello. Anyway, I can, I can project, I think. So you're right, and that's such a, a shame. It, uh, the books from the colonial period, are ex the ones that do get reprinted now, are extremely expensive. They're, they're, first of all, they're very long. You know, like I said, it's a thousand pages. So the editions that exist, and there are some editions, some scholarly editions, really nice ones, um, are quite pricey. But the good news is the digital version that's at the Copenhagen Library. So if you just put one month <laughs>
Uh, people receive me, uh, first of all, I've been working in this part of uh, Ecuador now for 25 years and everyone pretty much knows me. And um, so they receive me pretty warmly. I mean, there's a, there are some people who don't like me and um, some people I don't like. I mean, we are all people, but um, I can deal with that. But in general, um, I don't know, I have very cordial relations uh, with people and I would say that the that the people in in the area where I work are incredibly open and welcoming, and have a sense that um, that that they can spend time talking and doing things together. I mean, it's very different uh, from my life in Delray Beach, for example, where you know, I, you know, if I talk to my neighbor for what uh, 45 seconds every three months, that's a uh, <laughs> Maybe not even that often. It's more like just wave and don't come near. Um, so, so uh, you know, I'm I'm not a perfect person, and uh, but um, I would say that I was fairly well. You know, they call me Santa Claus. <laughs> and, married to an oh yeah, married to an Ecuadorian. <laughs> I haven't found that that's been all that helpful, to tell you the truth. 